Sandwich lease options. Hey, <laughs> we're back to sandwich lease options. All right, guys, I want to share screen with you and jump right into uh, sandwich lease options training here. And here's kind of the plan for the training. We are in session one right now, which we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, introducing sandwich lease options and do a little overview, give you a little example of how sandwich lease options work, what the benefits of them are. Uh, I think you're going to have a real eye opener here um, by the end of the session about how incredibly good they work. Uh, sorry, I misspelled in session number two here, rules for making great sandwiches. Um, <laughs> sandwiches. I could have said sandwich, sandwiches, uh, but no. Um, rules for making great sandwiches, that will be the next session. Session number three, we're going to do some case study stuff. We're going to dive into some real sandwich lease option scenarios and let you take a look at the inside so you see the mechanics of how it works. And then session number four, we're going to talk about the paperwork because that's really where we're wanting to get to. We want to get some paperwork filled out with the homeowner. All right. So, so uh, let's uh, let's talk about uh, sandwich lease options here a little bit. And let's give you an example of a sandwich lease option, just so you understand what sandwich lease options are. Um, there is a difference between sandwich lease options and assignment lease options. Or assignment lease options can also be called wholesale lease options. Right. Now, if you're doing wholesale lease options or assignment lease options, you are assigning your position in the deal, your contractual rights. You're assigning those or signing them over to the tenant buyer and in exchange for what we call a non-refundable option fee, right? Sometimes you hear me refer to it as the pay-to-play fee, okay? The pay-to-play fee. Now, that's the non-refundable option fee. Some people erroneously refer to it always as a down payment, okay? It may or may not be considered a down payment. But, but in the deal, you're assigning your position over in an assignment lease option to that tenant buyer, and that tenant buyer is giving you cash, that non-refundable option fee, and you are walking away. You are no longer legally tied to this deal. You are out. Contra contractually, you are gone, okay? That is an assignment lease option or a wholesale lease option. Now, that is really what I teach you to do a lot here, okay? Now, there is a upgrade version called the sandwich lease option. Now, what makes that different is, is you're no longer going to assign your position over to the tenant buyer. You are going to stay in the middle, okay? And you are going to basically sublease this property to the tenant buyer. You're still going to get the option option fee, okay? You're still going to collect that, but you're going to stay in the middle. And I'm going to show you an example of this and why you would want to do it will become clear, okay? And you'll understand the differences between the two. So let's go ahead and jump back into the share screen and I'll show you. Well, let's build an example together here. And uh, let's start with a homeowner. You got to have a homeowner, a motivated seller, okay? And uh, he has an example property of, let's say it's worth 150000 if you guys have questions or anything, please interrupt me. Please feel free to ask or uh, add. It's okay. Do you let the homeowner know that you're going to assign it to somebody else and you stay in the middle? Um, if, if I am staying in the middle, yes, I will. In either case, if I'm assigning it or if I'm going to stay in the middle, I do want the property owner to know. Uh, there are about five or six rules that you have to, uh, to abide by if you want to be great at making sandwiches. And I'm going to talk about those next week. But, Ryan, that's one of the rules. You already nailed one of them. <laughs> All right. So the, the, the seller has a property that's worth $150,000. Uh, we call them. Let's say we get generated this lead on automated REI, for example. We sent a text blast. The, they responded. We call them. We use the guts conversation and we pre-qualify them. They seem motivated. They have a house that's worth $150,000. And they said that they wanted some skin in the game. Okay. So they're going to want $2,500 down payment in their hands. All right. Everybody follow me so far? Now, they tell me that they would do this lease option monthly for $1,250 rent payment. They also are okay with a 36-month term. Okay, so these are kind of the parameters of our example deal here. The sales price of the house, we can go as high as and slightly beyond if necessary, but I try to not go beyond fair market value. So we can actually pick up this property from this guy using a lease, a lease uh, option, either an assignment or a sandwich here. And, and these are the parameters of the, the example deal here. So he's asking for a, a, a property that's $150,000 in value. He's asking 150. 
and that's okay. He's asking for $2,500 down payment cash, and that's okay. He's asking for $1,250 a month, and that's okay. He's also okay with this going on for 36 months before he gets cashed out at $150. All right, that's pretty much all that we need to know about the seller side of this deal. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the tenant buyer side. When you find a tenant buyer, you got to find a tenant buyer that can do more <laughs> than what we just listed for the seller here. Otherwise, you won't make any profits. So let's talk about the tenant buyer. The tenant buyer is okay with how much down? Well, you find a tenant buyer that has $7,500 down. Okay. He's also going to be able to rent the property from you at $1,500 a month instead of $1,250. Just bear with me, guys. We're, we're going somewhere. This is building. He's also willing and able to get qualified in 24 months. There's some rules here that we're going to talk about next week so you, you get an even more clear understanding here. But I'm just giving you a highlight example. 24-month term is what the tenant buyer would be okay with. Now, the sales price that we're going to sell to the tenant buyer is actually going to be, what do we do? We add about 10% to that total because it's three years. The sales price with the seller was 150 so we're going to mark it up to 165 for the tenant buyer. Okay. So you can see we have more money and stuff happening over here on the tenant buyer side than we do over here on the seller side. Thus, we are creating some profit centers. Well, let's talk about those profit centers here. I want to draw you a little uh, triangle here because things are starting to happen in our lease option scenario here where we're sandwiching this deal. Here we have you in the middle. That's you. <laughs> All right. Your tenant buyer in this scenario will be giving you what? $7,500 down. What are you owing the seller? Somebody tell me. What do you have to give the seller? $2,500. $2,500, yeah. So there's your upfront money, right? There's your upfront money. There's your upfront non-refundable option fee profits. Okay, let me write this down. So how much do you make? 5,000? 5, 5,000. Easy math. Easy math. Okay. So there's the down payment profits, 5,000. What else do we have to talk about? The rent payments. <clears throat> how much are you making in rent payments? 1,500. Well, you're collecting 1,500 and you're paying out 1,250, right? Right. So you make it 250? 250 per month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you also have 12 months of playtime. <laughs> Meaning <clears throat> that if after your tenant buyer, after 24 months, needs another six months, you're okay with that. You have room. You can be a little flexible here. You have given yourself oxygen in the deal to be able to give yourself and the tenant buyer time to actually get this done. Okay. Now, let's talk about the sales price. What's the differences here? Well, 15,000, 15,000, right? Um, he's going to be giving you 5,000 of this though, right? Yep. So you're going to be giving 2,500 to the seller. So what, what would be, what would be profits we would gain here? Somebody, somebody tell me. Well, you're going to owe 147.5, right? Yeah. So it'd be 7,500. Right, so 7,500. Right. Yeah. No, your profit would be seventeen five, <clears throat> right? One sixty five to one forty seven fifty would be seventeen five on your profit at the end. Or am oh, I at the end. Yeah, you're jumping to the end. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have, we haven't gotten to that yet. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. So um, let's uh, let's do a total here. Let's add this up since that's that's the direction that he's thinking, and that's kind of probably what everybody else is thinking too. Is let's put a calculator to this and figure out what the total profits for you in this deal are. What is it again, Joe? Well, I mean, in order, in order to do that, you have to take your 5,000 and then you have to take 250, right? And you have to multiply that by 36 months. Right. Make, right. Or 24 gotta, months. But I just thought you were talking because you had sales price. You're selling it to the, the tenant buyer for 165 and you've got, you owe the seller 147.5. No. So that's a, that's a difference of 17,000. 
okay, let's think about this. Let's think about this. Um, if the sales price that I owe the, the, the homeowner is 150, okay. All right. Uh, let's say here 150, and you're selling it for 165. Yep, and, and I'm getting That's from 15, 165, right? Okay. Right. Okay. And then you're. I forgot about your down payment that you already took. My bad, yeah. Justin. I'm yeah, that's okay. Up. Yeah, they're giving they're giving five thousand, right? So I'm just being greedy. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All Isn't right. Isn't that the option money? Yeah. Yeah, the option money. Yes, correct. But that's, that isn't considered a down payment. No, it's it's not technically a down payment. No. So um, we can take it into consideration as part of the greed. Uh, you can it, it, actually. What I do is I count the down payment money, option fee money, as part of. Um, their investment into the property, and I subtract that from their sales price. Right. So, in other words, they buy it from a, from me for one hundred and sixty five. If they put five thousand dollars in, in or seventy five hundred into my pocket, then I will subtract that seventy five hundred off of this one sixty five. Okay, that's how I do it. So, if you track if you subtracted one sixty five minus seventy five hundred, you get one fifty seven five hundred. Mm -hmm. So, there's still seven thousand five hundred dollars worth of equity there that we can grab when they do buy. Well, don't you, Justin, the 2500 that you gave the, the seller as a down payment, don't you deduct that from the 150000 as well? Yes. So that yes. you would only owe him $147,500. Yes. So it'd be $10,000. Yeah, so, so you're 10, back to 10000 Exactly. You caught me. You're right. <laughs> you caught me. I'm busted. Uh, yeah, so the, the sales price for the seller, 150 would also be reduced by the $2,500 we are giving him. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I just wanted to make sure that that's what, right. the way it went. So. So, my, so half of my brain was working. It was the other half that wasn't doing so good. <laughs> Well, that's good that half of it's working. So. It was it was the tenant buyer half over here that was on today, and this <laughs> this half over here was not on at all. Uh, you know, they used to tell me when I was in kindergarten, I, I used to live next to an alcoholic in a kindergarten. Um, I know that sounds funny, but it's true. He used to get out in the yard and dry heave in the morning and stuff like that. And uh, I remember walking home from school, and he would yell at me every day, and he'd say, hey, what'd you learn in school today? And I'd always say, I don't know, nothing. You know, that's what kids always say. Yeah. And he'd say, boy... Your body's fine. It's your mind that's messed up. <laughs> uh, just imagine getting that uh, reinforcement from your uh, kindergarten years <laughs> up. <laughs> from, from your uh, alcoholic neighbor. <clears throat> yeah, from my alcoholic neighbor. <laughs> Willard. That was his name, Willard. I love Willard. He was actually a pretty good dude. All right, so let's do a total a, a total here, and you guys walk me through it since this is I like this Socratic type situation where we all help out learning anyway. So let's let's add up our potential profits here. Down payment five thousand. Oh, somebody multiply two hundred fifty by six thousand. Not by twenty four is six thousand. By twenty four. Okay, so that's six thousand dollars. All right, so we have five thousand right here. We have six thousand. We have plenty of time, and, and then we, have we still 10, have. Here. 10,000 here. And then we have 10,000 that we can pick up right here on the back end. So total 21,000. So the grand total that we can make on this deal is, say it again. 21,000. $21,000. $21,000. Now, can you believe on a deal where there is no equity, okay, there is none, and there is $150,000 value, and... We're giving them every bit of that, that we can still make twenty one grand out of ten air. I mean, doesn't that seem like crazy? Like, like I'm, is the math wrong? Like I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> is the math wrong? No, it's not wrong. Okay, hold on. Let's go back and look at it one more time. This is not the wrong math. This is the question. right math right here. Twenty one thousand dollars in profits. Quick question. Yeah. I th so the sales price, uh, the sales purchase one fifty, sales price one sixty five. The difference that is fifteen thousand, uh, seventy five hundred. What 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 did we do with the other seventy five? Okay, uh, the yeah. Uh, what, what what question he's asking? I think is is uh, kind of what we were talking about a minute ago. I think we maybe confused him, but yeah, add the twenty five hundred deduction so to to your maths to let him understand. Yeah. Okay. So. The tenant buyer gives us, uh, we have a sales price of 150 with the seller. Hmm. And then the, 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 the tenant buyer is going to agree to 165000 So, And that's, that's not a huge spread there or anything. It's not a huge stretch. So we, that's totally doable. This is conservative numbers. 165000 So there's 15000 in equity there. Hmm. Right? So 15000 in potential profits that we could collect. Unfortunately, hmm. we don't collect that full fifteen right away. 
we only collected 7500 uh, So now the tenant buyer really technically only owes us 157500 because it was 165 and then he put 7500 in. Okay, was well, the down payment. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, Let's you be might careful want with using the word down payment, but yeah, it's it's kind of like a down payment. Yeah, okay. if you if you change the sales purchase at the one hundred and fifty on the bottom there to to reflect the the twenty five hundred quote unquote down payment is now one forty seven five right here, right? You know, you know, Victor, yeah. that's why I pay you the big bucks <laughs> because you're right. Yeah. So yeah, that there, the original price was one hundred and fifty minus the twenty five hundred deposit slash yeah. down payment. Yeah. So that's the balance deal. Yeah, you yeah. have to balance do. Does that make sense to you now, Mag? A little bit better? Yeah, totally. I was on mute, but yeah. Makes okay. Sense. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no problem, man. <clears throat> um, okay. So the total profits here on our sandwich uh, are <coughs> sandwich profits is 21000 you You're You're right, man. <laughs> okay. What if we did not sandwich this? What if we had assigned this deal over to the tenant buyer as a assignment lease option. As an assignment lease option, what kind of money would we have made then? Someone tell me. Depends on your option price. Well, let's assume that let's assume that the house is worth one hundred and fifty. Let's assume we have a deal with the homeowner for one hundred and fifty. He wants twenty five hundred down. Mm -hmm. Let's then you would have made twelve thousand five hundred. Say it again, Aisha. Twelve thousand five hundred. You make fifteen thousand on the spread minus the down payment twenty five hundred. That's twelve thousand five hundred. Not if it's assigned. That is correct. I'm talking that, about that an should... assignment. Yeah, no. He's going to charge. Said the sales price is one sixty five. But we're assuming here that the tenant buyer is only giving us seventy five hundred in cash. You don't 000. charge. That's right. Then you don't even charge the higher sales price either. No, you You're just not add going your... to give the spread to the seller. You add your option fee to the price. Yeah, you yep. just add the option fee part. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's how it works. That's how an assignment works. Yeah. So we would take the 150, we would add, you know, 7,500 to it. Yeah. But then your sales price isn't 165 either. That's correct. You're not, yeah, That's you're correct. not getting the back end. So you're not giving the back end part to the seller either. That's correct. Okay. So what would the sale price be on an assignment here? 1575. 1575, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you can see that we're. We're looking at two different angles here, and uh, yeah, but so, you can still make one six uh, fifteen thousand spread by taking a ten percent option fee. Yeah, if you took if you had a tenant buyer that came in and brought the fifteen thousand, you could go ahead and pick up all fifteen. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd have to give twenty five hundred to the homeowner though. Yeah, can so you still five. can you still five. charge charge one sixty five since it's two yeah. separate transaction and you just take the middle part of the sandwich. Twelve five. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I understood your your, your question there, Greg. Um, say yeah, it again. You 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 could go ahead and get your uh, get your deposit, and just take the middle part out of the sandwich, and you can still charge that uh, tenant buyer 165. You can still charge the difference between 165 and 150, can't you? Well, if you're going to assign it, though, remember you're going to oh, assign it. Okay, yeah, you're going to okay. assign it and then walk away. So you want to get yeah, as much cash okay. as you can. So what uh, I was I, talking about is kind of a hybrid where you're out of the middle as far as getting as far as getting uh lease payments yes as far as, far as getting a spread you could still do the the two sides of that transaction leaving out the middle right um uh, well okay if you did not assign it pretty much anything you charge over 150 you can take on as an option fee yes, yes. As long as the seller gets the 150 you could do 170 if you wanted if the buyer would take it you're going to get that option fee you're out of the deal. Plus, you're going to get your seventy-five hundred on the front end. No, that is the front end. Whatever the spread is that you <laughs> add to the one hundred and fifty, and you're going to spend this deal. That is your option fee. That is what you get. And nothing, nothing after two years. Nothing. That's it. You walk away. If you assign it. Yes. Right. Is that the direction you were wanting to go, Justin? Or uh, the direction that I want to go is where whatever you guys want to learn about this. Um, but so I, I appreciate the banter and the talk and the, the comments and questions. Um, I, I don't do any hybrid stuff other than I have one okay. technique that I do that's a hybrid. I will either – I got this circled over here on the seller side because I technically owe the seller 150000 for this deal in three, in three years, 1250 a month in the meantime. 
So I can guess, I can assign this deal over uh, to the tenant buyer for any kind of cash payment he has for option fee. So it could be 7,500, it could be all the way up to 15,000. What's your best method to get the most money? Sandwich, lease option, yeah. No, besides sandwich, I mean an assignment. Okay. Like, okay. Uh, how would you advertise right. that to get guys, the most money? You guys are asking for the secret ninja stuff. Oh. <laughs> all right, here's what I do. If I'm not, the only hybrid, so I either do an assignment and I walk away and I'll take whatever cash I can get, right? And then I'm out. Or I'll do a sandwich, which we just talked about and showed an example, and you make more money doing a sandwich by far. How much was it we were making on a on a lease option uh, assignment? What was that? Seventy five hundred, maybe maybe fifteen grand if we were if we found a great tenant buyer, right? How much were we going to make on a sandwich? Twenty one k. Yeah, see, there's six thousand dollars more there on a deal with no equity, on a deal with nothing but a motivated seller. That's I mean, it. if you're if you're in a position to build, start building your portfolio, but if you want to hit it, and get it. How can you get like a? How can you target to fifteen? Like, okay. can you say fifteen thousand down, or yeah. Yeah, fifteen thousand option fee? Uh, what I don't really advertise a set number on my ads for okay. properties for, when I'm looking for tenant buyers. I'll just say reasonable down payment required. Okay, that's a conversation I'll ask them personally or uh, over the phone. I'll say, you know, hey, uh, there is a down. Are, you're looking to rent, not buy. And they'll say, no, we, we would love to own a home, but our credit is horrible or this just happened and we can't qualify or blah, blah. Okay, so you do want to do a rent to own kind of thing here. This is what this is. It's not just a rental. I just want to make sure. Just Oh, yes, we want to do the rent to own. Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Um, Because I remember on the example you gave us uh, when you were listed on Greg List and Facebook. Yeah. You had an agreeable price with the seller, but you advertise it for three fifty. So you were making fifteen. So so you're actually making fifteen, but you didn't tell them that you how much down payment you want. I mean No, I can potentially make fifteen, you mean. Okay, so I put a sales price on on the ad, but I don't put a down payment price. Okay. I'm looking for fifteen. But if a guy calls me and he's got eleven thousand five hundred and I like him, my, my question I was, might take that say it. Say my it question was what if uh I know the example was you're the seller, if I remember, three thirty-five, and you advertise it for three fifty. I think, but let me, let's say for it. Yeah. And the tenant came down with twenty thousand dollars. Yeah. So, yeah. do you give five to the seller? I mean, yep. to the seller. Yep. Yep. In order to keep the math straight, you got to, or you got to tell the tenant buyer, "Hey, we don't need that much. Just give us fifteen and do it right now." <laughs> okay. So you guys are getting a good feel for the math. I like. One it. question. One yeah. question. Okay. If if he let let's say you said he he uh, the tenant buy comes with eleven thousand five hundred, and you're still seeking fifteen thousand, can you do a note for the remainder? Aisha, I'm going to give what? you a gold star because here's the hybrid. I was going to say this, and I got distracted. I got I got the assignment lease option where I assign the deal to the tenant buyer and I walk away for that cash, and that's all I get. Now I can also sandwich this lease option, stay in the middle. Play filter, pass through rents, keep 250 a month, so on and so forth, like we were talking about. That's a sandwich. Now, I could do that, um, and I'll make a little more money. But there is something in the middle, and you just said what it is. Okay? Now, sometimes what I'll do is if, I wanna, if I'm of the frame, mind, uh, frame of mind to assign the deal, I don't want to stay in the middle, but I still want to get that money. Then here's how you do it. The guy says, uh, I say, how much down payment are you working with? Oh, I'm working with uh, 7,500. Okay, great. You know, your, your work, your, your work history is great. Your, your income is fine. You got good rental history, everything. You know, you're a great dude. I think this is going to be great. You're looking for a great opportunity. Okay, here's what we'll do. I'll do the 7,500 today and we can set up something comfortable for you monthly to pay the difference. That's dope get, right there. Yes. I still assign the deal over to them and then I have a promissory note. Okay. Uh, that would be through your title company or is that between you and us? You can just go right on Google and print off a promissory note. In fact, at the end of this training session, not today's, but the four weeks, I'm going to give you one. <clears throat> gotcha. So that you can what, create. What if he don't pay? You know, that's the thing. That's the shortfall in the hybrid. Okay. Because they already have possession of the house. What do they always say on TV? Possession is what? Nine times of the law. <laughs> okay it, yeah. it's free money it's free money dude you know what i mean yeah hey, exactly. 7500 i'm out of it i'm just gonna keep talking to this dude collect my money yeah. if exactly. you stop paying i don't give a shit you and know that what is mean? exactly what happens chris i will tell you i have people who faithfully pay that and i have people who i have i have to try to collect from and that sucks 
okay? And they know they already live in the house, and they already know that I'm legally out of the deal, and they already know that they could tell me to fuck off, and what am I going to do? So, yeah, that's it. You, so that's you, 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 follow, you follow mechanics lean in case they ever try to refi yeah. or sell the property. Or, you can or a memorandum. I could yes, I could do all the oh, I could do all those things. I could I could I could even sue him in court and I could win. Memorandum right. is easier. You're clouding the title. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all true, but there's very little that I can really do to put the pressure on him today to cough this money up. Okay, so you know, um, you will sometimes have somebody that just decides that they're done with that, and you know, you pretty much figure that that's the guy that's also not going to buy the house either. So that's kind of an indication that there may be a rough uh, rough patch ahead with this person. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe not, but, but that is one way to, to kind of do a, an assignment lease option. And, you know, that's, that's not the technique I want to share today, but yeah, you're right, guys, you can that, do that. So quick question, just on the terminology, right? Yeah. So we have the sand, sandwich lease, lease option that the one that you just talked about. And then the lease, the lease option assignment is the promissory note, right? Uh, well, the lease option assignment <clears throat> is a wholesale lease option and you don't have to have a promissory note. But what we're talking about is, is if you were trying to collect fifteen thousand in down payment and a person came short of that, let's say they had twelve thousand instead of fifteen. Okay. You might say to them, "Hey, let's go ahead and do the deal today for the twelve thousand that you do, have, and let's set up some monthly comfortable payments for the other three thousand. How much is comfortable for you monthly towards that?" Okay. And they might say, "Well, fifty, sixty, seventy-five dollars, hundred dollars a month." Okay, great. Great. I don't care. Okay, I'm technically not in a sandwich. Yeah, I'm just in a assignment lease option where I have chosen to create a promissory note to help them pay that fee to me. Okay, but most of the time I just take the cash and walk. All right, there are some cases where I do a promissory note, yes, but typically standard. I'm either doing a straight assignment lease option or I'm doing a straight sandwich, one of the two. So, what's the difference between the the regular mm -hmm. assignment lease option and then wholesaling? That's a, the assignment lease option is a wholesale lease option. Yep, that's. What oh, it's do. a wholesale. It's a cash offer wholesaling. No. Nope, okay. Nope. It's it's called a wholesale lease option because you're assigning it over, much like you would an ugly house deal, if you mm. were assigning it over. So that's why uh, wholesale. It's called a wholesale lease option. Oh, it's on a on a pretty house. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. You're 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 with us, man. And also, <laughs> and and here's a, a follow up question. So the sandwich sandwich lease option, we have to be responsible for the house, right? Well, that's a great question, and uh, I want to talk about this. And uh, I know we, we've got probably ten minutes left, and we'll, we'll try to wrap it up. But but let's talk about real, this. real quick, Justin. If you yeah. don't mind, yeah, put that up again so I can get a screenshot of it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and. Uh, are you good, Victor? Yeah, all good. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about risk. What about risk? Okay. Are there any risks to us? Let's let's do the Socratic learning here. You guys participate. What are the risks here involved in a sandwich lease option? I think they just hard to do virtually because you're not there. Well, it, it could be virtual. I, I like to do sandwich lease options in my own in my own network here. In my own current marketplace. And I like to do assignment lease options elsewhere. Now that's just my preference. You can you can design your business any way you choose. You could you could do this virtually just as easily. I just choose not to. Uh, I, I I'll tell you why, and I, and I'm ashamed of it. Be honest with you. But you guys have heard my story. And back when I got started doing lease options, I put together ten in one year, in the first year, and I did all sandwiches. And then I went and spent all the option money that I collected. And then what happened? The market crashed. <laughs> People stop paying. The tenant buyers stopped paying. The phone started ringing. Okay. I decided then that I was going to be more careful about my sandwich business. Lease options, wholesaling and assignment, you get paid, you walk away. Not a problem. A sandwich, though, you're staying as the meat in the middle of the sandwich. That's why it's called a sandwich. You got the seller, you got you in the middle, and then you got the tenant buyer over here, and you're going to stay in the middle like a sandwich. So what are the risks that I'm talking about? Well, what happens when the tenant buyer stops paying? Yeah, that's what Greg said. What happens when the tenant buyer stops paying rent? What else could happen? What you else have could go wrong pay. here? Go ahead and say it again, Aisha. You have to pay. You're responsible. You were the one in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're that that homeowner is going to call you and say, "Hey, what 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 happened to the rent this month, man? 
Mm-hmm. My deal's with you. Your deal's with this other guy. He didn't pay, but no risk. I don't have a deal with him. I got a deal with you. Why didn't Why didn't I get a check? Okay. What else could happen? Anything else we can think of? The toilet Ooh, breaks. You... Say it again, uh, Aisha. I, I heard Mag say the toilet break. What would you say? I was saying something major happens, and you have have you have to have the insurance on it to take care of those major things happening. Hmm. What kind of insurance are we talking about? Not home warranty. Home warranty does SHIT. We renters insurance. Renters insurance only covers them for their belongings, but not the structure. You're on the lease. What about liability? Okay, I'll give you an example, guys. This is how I learned this the hard way. I had a, I had a sandwich lease option deal put together. I liked the couple that moved in. They were okay. They put a nice chunk of money down, which I'd already blown. Okay. The guy came to me. He said, he called me one day. He said, guy, uh, I got to tell you something. I was like, whoa, what's going on? I'm thinking, uh-oh, what the fuck? <laughs> what you want to call me and tell me something? Okay. What, what do you want to tell me? He said, I was having a cigarette and I got a phone call and I went out. Oh, I was also cooking. <laughs> had something on the stove, put my cigarette down on the counter, went outside on the back deck, was talking on the phone, came back inside and the entire kitchen was on fire. Ooh. Don't know if it was the cigarette or the stuff on the stove, but something sparked something and here we go. I said, oh my God, man, is it bad? Dude, you don't set the kitchen on fire and it ain't bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> okay, that whole, that whole kitchen was toast, like uh, not functional anymore. And you know, when you have a fire in a house like that, the smoke gets everywhere. It's in the carpet, in the drapes, on the walls, and it's everywhere. It stinks. Okay. I'm thinking, uh oh, what do I do now? So I called the homeowner and I said, hey, we've had a little, we've had a little problem, a little hiccup here. Uh, would you call your homeowner's insurance and have them, you know, send somebody out and, and fix this place for us? He said, yeah, 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 no problem. So he calls the insurance company. He calls me back and he says, we have problems, man. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, insurance company won't pay for it because i don't have a renter's policy and i just have a homeowner's policy and i don't have a renter's policy and so they said that they wouldn't pay for it i said no kidding what what did they say we should do anything he said they said go see if the tenants renter's insurance would pay for it i was like fuck okay so i go to the tenant and find out he doesn't even have the insurance Ooh. so everybody's looking at me right I'm the meat and yeah. sandwich, right? So I did have to fix that situation. It was a bad scenario for me, and I learned my lesson. What lessons can we learn from this? You guys tell me. Make sure that the insurance coverages are in place and yeah. that you have them, or not do a, not, you know, stay away from sandwiches. Yeah. You needed the coverage there, Justin. Did you need it as a uh, as a uh, landlord? Yeah, but remember, I don't own the house, so I can't get insurance for shit on anything. So make sure that the homeowner has a renter's insurance, a per landlord insurance. Perfect. Yes, landlord's insurance. I said renters, but yes, you, you know what I mean. <laughs> exactly. Make sure the homeowner has a renter's policy. All right. You also want to make sure that tenant buyer has his tenant insurance just in case. Okay. You never know. You never know what they'll do or what they won't do until they do or don't. But, you know, when you need it, you want to, you want to have somebody to call. I'll tell you what. I have car insurance. What about you? <laughs> <laughs> right? I have car insurance. And I, I got a, I've got a son that just went out recently, and he got in a little fender bender. It wasn't even his fault. And the lady admitted that she was the one in fault, not him. Police came out, did a report, all nine yards. Okay. You would think open and shut case with the insurance company, they'd fix my car. Do you know I had to get red in the face, veins popping out, screaming, cursing, yelling, threatening lawsuits on his client and his insurance company and whatever else? You know, like I'm talking about the agent. I'm yelling and screaming at the agent. Yeah, because they just don't want to pay nothing. That's how they make money. <laughs> all right. Now. Long story short, they fixed the car. Cost me nothing. That's the power of having good insurance. <laughs> okay. You have to have your insurances set up right on sandwich lease options. Okay. If you do, 
you're okay. That's mitigating that risk. All right. That's mitigating the risk. What is another thing you must do in order to mitigate risk? Um, a side note, even on regular lease options, one should still make sure that the owner seller has a landlord insurance. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's absolutely. an additional cost, just an additional cost for them. Uh, right? Yes, but not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. So they don't have to have two policies. They just have to switch their regular residential, like I'm living there policy to I'm not living there, I'm renting it. They just have to let them know and there will be a little bump in premium, but it will be pretty insignificant. Yeah, you can bullshit that into what you're paying, you know, yeah. add a couple, add 500 yeah. more bucks or whatever. Yeah. So, so this answers the question somebody asked earlier, Ryed, do you let them know that you're doing a sandwich lease option? Do you let the homeowner know? You got to let them know so they can change the homeowner's policy, right? I mean, you don't want to get caught in this pickle where you're not insured properly. Um, a another thing that you have to do to mitigate risk is... Somebody tell me what I wrote there. <laughs> don't spend all your profits on you. you. <laughs> don't buy a car. Don't go get my stuff upgraded. Yeah. Right. Don't have a picnic. <laughs> yeah. So if you're like me back, back when I was one of the story I was telling where I got in hot water with that sandwich lease option. Well, yeah, it, it could have all been avoided, but I just didn't know any better. And one thing I did was, is I didn't align myself and the homeowner and the tenant buyer with the right insurances. Number two, I immediately, before I even got home, was start, I started spending that money, you know, and I spent every damn penny of it. So now when the homeowner, what could potentially happen is, is the, the tenant buyer moves out. Okay, now I got to make a payment. Ooh, that hurts real bad. If I spent all the profits already, can't spend them all. It, don't mess around with sandwich lease options if you're horrible with dealing with money. Okay, because you need to run it like a business. You need to have a slush fund, an emergency fund. You need to have some cash flow. You need to have some stability or you need to have a good plan. Like, yes, he's going to give me 7,500 down. I'm going to take 3,500 of that and put it away where I don't, I don't spend it just in case something happens and I need it. Okay, and, I'm, and I mean that. Leave it in there. Don't touch it. Okay, if you do those things, sandwich lease options become much, much, much more safe. Okay. There's some other rules that we're going to jump into next week, too. Uh, you guys you guys are great, and you're, you're kind of pushing me in the, the tempo of the flow here on how, how we're uh, divulging the information, But and I like that. Um, let's talk about the three profit centers real quick. We're going to get more into rules next week, too, and things that you must do or must not do, okay? But sandwich lease options is a kick-ass way to make money. Look, look at this, man. <clears throat> this is what surprises me about lease options, sandwiches. This doesn't seem like a big deal to me. This is a $150,000 deal. This is a small deal, basically, just a regular, normal house. The guy even wants $2,500 down, $1,250 a month rent. That sounds normal. But I'm able to get $1,500 a month out of the, the tenant buyer. That $250 a month, did you know that is $6,000? We talked about this earlier. That's $6,000 extra in your pocket. What if the tenant buyer doesn't buy in 24 months, but he needs extra time and he stays renting from you for another 12 months, 36 months. He goes the full 36 months that you have. How much money extra are you making then? Another 3000 $9,000. Being a landlord is pretty cool, huh? <laughs> All right. So, you know, these little numbers, they add up in time. They certainly do. So how do they add up? They add up like this. You get that, that upfront, non-refundable option fee. That's that pay-to-play fee. Which you can get from another tenant if that one doesn't work out as well, right? Yeah. yeah. If that guy moves out in 12 months, he said he would buy it within 24. He moves in 12. Guess what Justin does? Justin reaches into his little emergency kit where I put away a little bit of the cash from up front in the deal. I pull out a little bit of cash from that. I'll send the payment to the seller, one payment, while I'm advertising the property to find another tenant buyer who will bring me another $7,500 in cash. <laughs> and around we go. The ride never ends. But what does it do to your credibility with the seller? You know, that's a great question, Aisha, and I've never really had it be an issue for me. 
Um, I imagine in my mind that when I call a homeowner and say, hey, uh, typically they're calling uh, me or I'm calling them maybe, uh, but it'll be something like, uh, hey, you know, this, this tenant buyer we have in there, uh, you know, Jim and Sarah, yeah, well, they're going to have to move, unfortunately. They're not going to be able to complete this deal. But here's what's going to happen, man. Um, it, one, I'll give you the opportunity if you want. You can just have the house back. Or number two, I'll put somebody else in there and we'll wrap this up within 36 months. It's up to you. You tell me what happens next. Okay. That's that's honest. That's respectable. That's giving him options more than I'm really legally required to. So, you know, yes, it sucks for them to have to think about this because they don't even want to think about it. it. This is They want this off their plate. Remember, this is a homeowner that's motivated. So, yes, it's an inconvenience, but it's not that big of an inconvenience, especially if I'm there replacing the tenant buyer with someone else. Okay. I have even gone to the homeowner and done this, Aisha. Hey, Mr. Homeowner. The tenant buyer is moving out. He's got to go to Washington State. He's got to take care of his grandma. And so I don't know what you would like to do, but here's what's going to need to happen. You're probably going to have to go ahead and make your payment without any collecting any rent for the next month or maybe two. But I'll put somebody else in there if you want. And we'll just do the deal again. Or you can have the house back. You tell me what happens next. <laughs> yeah. And make them pay it. I've even made the homeowner pay it. So, you know... It's creative real estate, so everything's fluid. You know, think through all the possibilities and then just step out on something. But I, I'm not too worried about the them looking down on me uh, because of that, because it does happen. And it will happen to you if you're in this business. And you will have that conversation with the homeowner at some point. And the homeowner, if you just tell him what his options are and say, hey, listen, what happens next? They'll tell you exactly what will make them happy. And that's okay. And most of the time, they don't want that house back. Like I'm talking about nine times out of 10, they don't want that house back. So option B is, is okay. Well, you put somebody else in there and you say, I have to make this month's payment and that's it. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I'll get to work on it immediately. We'll get somebody else in there and we'll, we'll just continue on like nothing. Okay, great. Pfft, done. <laughs> okay. I love all these what if questions. You guys ask me all the hard shit. <laughs> that's okay. I love it. So you get an upfront fee. That's that non-refundable. You get the monthly, and that adds up to big money. It really does. It adds up fast. And then at the end, when they buy, you get that back in cash, equity cash out. That's kind of what we were talking about with this example. So you got the, the down payment profits. You got the monthly rental income. And then you have the sales price profits right here. So grand total, 21000 versus if you were assigning the deal, maybe 7500 In this example, you would make $7,500, maybe 5000 really, because you're going to give 2500 to the seller. So you're going to make five grand if you assign this deal. If you sandwich this deal, you're going to make twenty one grand. And if you stagger them, right? Um, you can have profit centers two years down the line and take a whole year's vacation. Yeah, this is how you build a short-term rental portfolio. Short-term. Because, you know, hopefully they buy these properties and you cash out. Hopefully you get this, these big checks. But you're exactly right. You can set this up to where you have a pretty decent monthly residual income coming in every month. If you did one deal a month, one deal a month, and you sandwiched it. Let's say you did that deal every month. That one deal. And that's a low deal, 150 grand. That's a small one. No equity in it, nothing. Not even a big profit centers, really. Just, just mundane as hell. If you did that deal 12 times a year, what's 12 times 21,000? Somebody did a lot of damn money. money. I'm a um, steel worker. Two hundred fifty-two thousand. Uh, That's a lot of money. Two hundred fifty-two thousand. So, ideally, in two to three years, you're making a quarter million dollars. I work hundred-hour work weeks for, for for a lot less than that. Yeah, I, I don't doubt you, brother. Oh man, yeah, that right there. That's that's lovely. Yeah. That's, That's why life. we do sandwiches. Yeah. yeah. We do sandwiches just for that one reason, man, because it's just, it's, it's hella good money that I, you know, like I had a boss one time that used to say this and I said it the other day and I felt weird for saying it, but he said, you know, I'd have to shovel a lot of pig shit to get that much money. 
I guess pig farmers think that way. I don't know. I got to shove a lot of pig shit to get that. Oh, yeah. Or you could do one deal a month in this business. Which one do you prefer? What happens next, guys? You tell me. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. You tell um, me. Victor, what you got? Yeah. No, Justin, I was going to ask you if you can uh, maybe list on there the three insurances that we want to have, make sure that we covered on these sandwich leases. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that there's three, but. Um, well, there's, 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 the, there's the renter's insurance yep. for the renter. That's it right there. Yep. Renter's yep. insurance. There's the homeowner's insurance policy. And then there is the landlord insurance, right? Nope. Or nope. The, the, uh, the landlord policy is the homeowner's policy. Oh, got it. Okay. That's what so, you call it. You just call it something different. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so okay. currently he just has a normal, uh, like I live there kind of policy. Like it's just my house. Yeah. But when he moves out and a tenant moves in, if anything happens, the insurance company will, will balk at it because he doesn't live there. It wasn't him. And so, um, you have to have him switch it over to a landlord policy. Okay. Non-owner policy or, yes. or, or non-resident policy. Yes. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. And that will cost a little bit more, but not much. Okay. Right. All right. Now here's another question since we're going to dive deep into possible snags. I just thought of one and it dawned on me. I have had this happen too. What happens if when your homeowner goes and gets a, a policy that is a landlord policy, he switches from a resident homeowner to a non-owner, I mean a non-resident homeowner landlord type policy. What happens then when that does that does that insurance company somehow some way notify notify his lender that there's been a change of policy? You want to Sometimes, them? yeah, uh huh, yeah. Sometimes that insurance company will notify that guy's lender, his home loan mortgage guy. They'll notify that company. They'll send a note to Chase Bank, for example, that says, "Hey, the policy has been switched from a resident." to a non-resident landlord policy. Now, could this be a problem or could this be not a problem? It would be a problem because they could start to you know, want to exercise clauses in the, in the, in the agreement, in the, in the um, mortgage contract. If you have a conventional loan, no problem. Right. No problem. If I'm in some kind of a program, like maybe FHA or Fannie or Freddie or something like this, they don't want me making this a rental property. They loaned me money on a special program to buy a home of my own. Now, for me to turn that into a rental property, usually within a certain time frame. So they'll have to have lived there for seven years before they can make it a rental or something. Every now and then, you may run into a scenario where the mortgage company gets notified and they don't like it. Yeah, VA but, loans are like that as well. Yeah, VA loan, for example. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so what happens then? Somebody tell me. What happens in that case where the mortgage company got notified that this is now a rental property and they don't like it? What happens? They could call the they could call the loan due and payable. They could call the note due, but they are not going to. Nope. <laughs> okay, it is all smoke and mirrors and bullshit for the most part. They mm -hmm. are not going to call the note due because the payments keep rolling in. That'd be like me saying, "Hey, Victor, stop sending me money. I just don't like it anymore." Yeah. <laughs> it's never yeah. going to happen. Right. It's not never going to happen. Okay. Yeah. So I don't like the way you're making that money. Yeah. So, so in this business, there is some, in the sandwich business, there is some risks, but you mitigate those risks by being transparent, being honest. You never make promises you can't keep. Don't write checks you can't cash, that can't cash. Okay. So just, just play straight with it. Be, be upfront and honest with everyone about the situation at all times. And you'll be fine if you don't spend all your money. That's the deal. Don't spend all your money. Okay, guys. Is, is, is there a way um, to have the new um, lease purchaser purchase a home warranty? I guess they, they probably can't because at that point they're not on title. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, but, I don't think you know, so but that, that would be something that you could maybe encourage the homeowner to do and then you could create money in the deal for it. Yeah. Uh, that is something that some of the club members in here are doing. I, I have I don't personally do it, but I, I think it sounds like a pretty whippy idea. Right. To include yeah. a home warranty in the deal as well to fix things or what have you. If the water heater goes out, you know. Mm -hmm. Stuff like this. So now, when you when you say that, are you talking about um um tenant buyer paid or Yes. In, the, in, in their own name or in the name of the of the landlord? Yeah. It'd be in the name of the landlord. Of the, of the but but okay. then uh, but then that would be uh, the tenant buyer would be compensating them in some respect, or I would okay. out of the uh, out of my option fee or something. That's right, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem.
there is some risk to doing sandwich lease options and I want you to mitigate that risk. Okay. Um, you will sometimes hear people with a bit of a boohoo story about sandwich lease options. And I understand why I've been there. I've made these mistakes. I learned this the hard way. <laughs> okay. So I've got some rules that I go by when it comes to sandwich lease options. And I want to go through them with you tonight. All right. And let's go ahead and share screen here. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it with the whiteboard here. Rules for doing sandwich lease options. Let's just jump right into the rules. We were talking a little bit last week about some of the rules because you guys are really, really, uh, you guys are kind of advanced and, and trying to uh, push the tempo a little bit on me. I love that. Okay, rule number one is put the homeowner in the driver's seat, okay? Now, I want you guys to listen very carefully about what I'm, what I'm about to say next, okay? If you want to avoid in a situation where your tenant buyer moves out midstream, <clears throat> if you want to avoid an uncomfortable conversation in an uncomfortable scenario and a finger pointing session where they're all pointing at you and blaming you because this tenant buyer moved out, it didn't work. Now what's going to happen? Okay. Then you need to set up your lease options, especially your sandwich lease options properly you need to put the homeowner in the driver's seat. Now, here's how I do it. Very, very simple. In the closing section of our phone call, when I'm talking to the lead, I'll say this, Mr. Homeowner, usually it follows some objection that he has. Oftentimes they will ask the question, what happens if they move out? What happens if they stop paying? What happens if they hurt something in the home? What happens if this goes awry? Okay, if they ask that question, my response is always this, Mr. Homeowner, we do background checks, rental checks, make sure the landlords they've had before have good stories about them, income verification, back, uh, criminal backgrounds, tenant screens. We do the whole nine yards. Plus, these are folks that want to qualify for the home loan to buy this home, so they're not your normal tenants. But I do understand your concern. If I change the agreement to read that you can either approve or disapprove of this potential tenant buyer I want to put in here, if, you'll, if I put it in the paperwork that you can approve or disapprove, does that make you feel more comfortable and can we move forward? Okay. That's exactly how I explain it to the homeowner. Why am I doing this? Because in the, in the, in the chain, okay, let's just play it straight here. Let's play it super straight. There are some coaches and gurus out there that tell you to promise them everything. Promise the homeowner that you will uh, evict that person that you will come in and make the payment in their, in their absence. If, if, if the tenant buyer moves out, if this falls apart, that you'll come in and you'll paint the place again and you'll, you'll clean the carpet and you'll get it all ready to go. That you'll, you'll do all this stuff. Hey, you don't need to worry about anything. We'll take over the maintenance and the payments. And as far as you're concerned, you are out and gone and done. <clears throat> oh, that sounds real good. And that sells real good, but that's just not reality. Unless you got a lot of money that you can bankroll that deal. <clears throat> and I say that because about 60% of these tenant buyers will buy. About 40% of the time, they're going to find an excuse to not buy and they're going to move out mid midterm. You guys are like, oh man, this is bad news. Why are you? I thought you was training us to do this, like get us excited about it and shit. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you the truth, okay? But now I'm going to show you how you mitigate this and you, you, you fix it. You plan for these, okay? So that you can monetize and make even more money, to be honest. Okay, so you knowing that knowing that only six out of ten are going to work out. Okay, if you go in promising the world to that homeowner, you've got a four in ten chance of having to eat your words. Okay, and it won't even be because you decided; it'll be because the tenant the tenant buyer decided to move. Okay, so you won't always want to make that homeowner a part of the deal with you, Mister Homeowner. If I can change the documents to allow you to be in the driver's seat, you can approve or disapprove. Before they move in, does that make you feel more comfortable? Okay. Yes. Great. Now I have a partner in the seller. Okay. Sometimes the seller will be like, hey, what happens if they stop paying and, uh, and, 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 and we have to evict them? Like, what, what happens then? I would say, well, Mr. Homeowner, you tell me what happens. What, what would happen normally if, if, what do you think would happen? He said, well, I would have to evict those people. Yeah, you would. 
Yeah. Cause you technically, you're still the owner, right? Like I'm going to have, I'm going to be a part of this deal, but remember I put you in the driver's seat. So we're gonna have to work together to get those people out of there and replace them. And here's what I'll do, Mr. Homeowner. When I replace them with someone else, if you've had to make a payment or two in the meantime, I'll give you that money back when I put someone new in. Did you guys catch that? Okay. See, I'm setting all these up before I actually pin the deal. Like this is, I'm, I, this is part of my negotiations. I'm, I'm negotiating a plan for failure. And that plan, in my mind, does not include me stepping up and making these damn payments. What it does include is me coming back to the table to find a new tenant buyer while he's making, the seller's making the payment, and then I can come in and I can reimburse him out of my new option, my new non-refundable option fee. I just collected another 10 grand out of a second tenant buyer here. I'll give you 3,500 of that to catch up. That's fair. That's honest. And I'm still making money, okay? And I'm not telling this homeowner, blue sky, blue sky, blue sky, while it's fucking thundering. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. That's why people get pissed at you. Because, and, and, yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask, well, couldn't you, couldn't you do that, like, anyway, since you got the first option money, uh, so you can keep the deal going so they won't get pissed that they're, yeah. that they're, that they're dishing out the money? That yeah, you, you could, it, you know. And then just can, get that back. Yeah, absolutely. That's so one way to do it, Philip. When you get that first non-refundable option fee, let's say it was 10 grand, if you were a smart business person and you didn't run out to the Home Depot and Best Buy the next day and spend all 10 grand of it, if you put 3,500, four grand, five grand in the hole somewhere, okay, then you could eat those payments, all right? But, you know, so you, you could, you could. So there's a, you know, this is creative real estate. So there's a couple, at least a couple ways to do it there. Okay, I've done it both ways and they both work. You just have to have a plan here, okay? So make sure... That when you're talking with the homeowner, you use some of these phrases that I'm using, okay? And if the homeowner says, hey, you know, um, well, who's going to evict these people? Don't be like, well, I'm going to go in there and I'll evict them and blah, blah, okay? You know what? You're probably going to need that guy's help, especially if you're new in this business. Wouldn't you rather have a partner with that homeowner than like somebody pointing his finger at you saying, what are you going to do? You better fix this. You said this, and now look at this, okay? That's a horrible feeling, and I've been there. OK, put the homeowner in the driver's seat. Let's change that because. Or don't spend all the money. <laughs> I think that's fair. Put the put the homeowner in the driver's seat or don't spend all the money. One of the two. That's a good that's a good one. Uh, anybody have any comments or, or thoughts on that? That's kind of a that's a pretty big topic. We could talk about that a while. Anybody have anything they want to add to this? Yeah, I got a quick question. Yeah. The, um, yeah. So I know we talk about the mortgage payments. Do we do we um, outsource that to a third party company to make those payments, or do we have do we get the payment and we make our payments ourselves? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's totally up to you. Okay, some folks like to have uh, an escrow company hold on to this stuff, and that's a great idea. It's not absolutely one hundred percent necessary. Um, I'm going to talk about this more in rule number five, I think it is. So hang on to that. Hang on to that. We'll get into that. Okay. Number two is. Um, wow, you're going to make me wait. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Give yourself longer than you give the tenant buyer. What do I mean, guys? Somebody tell me. Oh, yeah. You, you, you create a contract for, say, 36 months, an agreement with the seller for 36 months, uh, but you only give the tenant buyer 24 months. Yeah. Yeah. What would even be better is if I gave, had a 36 month contract with the homeowner, but then I gave the tenant buyer 18, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, if he even moves better. out, let's say he moves out at the 12 month mark or 13th month mark. Now I can really have time to do this all over again, don't I? Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, you have to consider if you give this guy 24 months and you have a 24 month contract, yeah. And he plays around with it till the 23rd month. And then he goes and figures out that he's still 90 days away from a loan. Guess what? His stuff expired. Give him some, give him some playroom. Okay. So if you've got a tenant buyer that can qualify in 24 months, make sure that you've got a note. I mean, uh, the, the uh, agreement with the seller that you can do it for at least 36 or six months beyond where he's at 32 or something, you know, give him a little bit of window, give yourself longer than you give the tenant buyer. If you don't, let's say you mess you mess up and you go in and you give the tenant buyer 36 months and you only had 24 to begin with. <laughs> okay? Yeah. 
I mean, it's possible that somebody does that. That's silly. That doesn't even mathematically add up. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. you can't give away something you don't have. Right. Uh, but you don't want to give the whole thing away. So if you have a 36-month term with the homeowner, then give the tenant buyer six months beyond what he can tell you that he needs. If it's a couple years, then give him 31 months or something. Okay. You first off want to make sure that they're wanting to rent to own this thing and not just lease it. Okay. You're not trying to slide the option agreement in there or, <laughs> or the assignment or whatever it is, you know, uh, and trick them into this. Okay. Make sure this is what they want to do. And, and then, and then go by this guideline here. You must find out if they have two years of good rental history. If they don't want you calling their previous landlords, there is a reason why, y'all. If I was renting a house from Steve for 12 months and I moved out, and now I'm afraid of anybody talking to Steve because I know Steve's going to talk some real bad stories on me because I left his place in a dump and I didn't pay him the last three months I lived there. I'm looking for you. Yeah, he's probably looking for me. So <laughs> don't call him. Okay, so you must verify they have two years of good rental stories. Okay. Okay. Number two, make sure they have jobs that produce enough income to buy that house. That's about three times what the payment is, minimum, minimum. If the house is $1,500 a month, they need to be making a minimum of keep money where they get to keep it, $4,500 a month. That's a minimum. That's tight. <laughs> okay. What about, making, what, about, what about if it's, uh, he's, he's getting like some cash money? And some, uh, you know, because he's self-employed. I'm sorry, say that again, Mag. I didn't understand. If they got in some cash money because they are self-employed, you know, self-employed people, sometimes they get cash and sometimes they get check. Uh, yeah, self-employed people, they will have to prove their income. And how they prove their income is with tax returns and bank statements. Okay. So here, let me share this with you. I'm not sure you guys are seeing it, but I want to make sure you see it. Were you guys seeing this? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Follow this guy. This little cheat sheet here. All right. You can see number one, two years of good rental history. Number two, jobs that produce income sufficient to support the payment. Number three, make sure they have that money in hand for the option fee. Okay. You're not in the business of helping people. Okay. <laughs> like you are going to help people, but you are in the business with the crazy idea of turning a profit here, right? It trips me out. I have had several people in my short coaching career come to me and say, you know, my big why for getting into real estate is I really, really want to help the homeless people of America. And I want to build a blocks of, of free housing for people where they can come and they don't have to worry about, oh, okay, okay, that's wonderful. <laughs> well, well, when you get back from Pluto, let me know and we can talk about reality. Okay, I'm not trying to poo poo your dream, but that's crazy shit, man. You are not going to be able to be a philanthropist. <laughs> okay, in that sense, until you've made some money, <laughs> help yourself. Charity starts at home, right? <laughs> okay, so they must have this option fee. If they don't have the option fee, I'm not willing to talk much longer. Okay. I may talk a little bit longer and say, well, um, is there anywhere you could come up with some down payment, like maybe your grandma or uh, your, your mom, or maybe you could get it off some, some credit cards or anything like this? I mean, any kind of loan you can get from Uncle Larry or – no? Okay. All right. Well, this isn't going to be a good fit for you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Click. If they say, oh, yeah, I've got that money. I've got, I've got $12,000 I could put into this. Oh, you do? You have $12,000? Okay. Where is it? Uh, uh, well, uh, 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 well, it's uh, – a well, we have we have twenty seven hundred right now. Say it again. Under the mattress. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we have twenty seven hundred now under the mattress, uh, but uh, but we we got we're waiting on a, a settlement check from a lawyer, and it's coming in. It should be here any day. Bullshit. You ain't got no money. You don't want that guy anyway. You don't want him. Yeah. Make sure they have the money. Oh well, I got that money. I could do twelve thousand down. Where is it? It's in well, the I bank. I can get it. You can? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Is, is it in the bank? <laughs> where is it? It's in the bank. Is it in your checking account where you could write a check or have a cashier's check drawn on it? Because we will need certified funds and we'll need them when signatures are due and keys are exchanged. Is this going to be a problem, Mr. Tenet Bar? Okay. 
I'm not playing around with the money. That's why I'm in business. <laughs> okay. Some of you guys aren't used to talking to people that way, but you better learn. <laughs> There's an old proverb that comes out of the book of uh, Proverbs in the Bible. Solomon wrote it. And it says that the rich man answers roughly. The rich man answers roughly. Yeah. Short and to the point. Have you ever noticed people that are really good with money are usually like the no bullshit, like right to the point kind of people, especially when talking about money? Yeah, sure. You need to you with the gold makes the rules. Yeah. You have to become become this a little more than where you are, where you are currently in your life. I've had to do it myself. I've had to step up a little bit in this. Okay. Because if you're not this, then the alternative is the beggar guy. And, oh, well, you've got 2,700. Oh, well, that, uh, we might be able to do something with that. And, uh, oh, you're not getting it until next Friday. Oh, you're supposed to have a, oh, you got the surplus check you're waiting on and you're going to let, okay. No, I'm not trying. This isn't UNICEF, okay? <laughs> uh, is, is this a download? Uh, do what? Is this a download? Oh is yeah, this is yeah. This is in the uh, the outsource lease options 2.0 course. This is in the pre-qualify your tenant buyer module. But I'll, I'll I'm going to throw it all together. I'll put it in the uh, VIP room to, in the group tonight. If you want to download this. Number four is willing to do a tenant screening. If this all sounds good, then they can see the house. Okay. So I'll ask them, I'll say, hey, you know, you have to do it, you know, in order to qualify here, you'll have to submit to a background check, criminal records, all that credit stuff, everything. Is that going to be a problem? If you're telling me anything wrong, I mean, I'll find out about it then, right? I don't mind talking to them like that. You know, I'm not going to leave much to chance here. Why do I want to know about their credit? Somebody explain that to me. Why do I want to know about these guys' credit? Builds character. What kind of person they're going to be paying their bills? Sure. Or, yeah, also you want to know if they're actually going to be able to qualify at some point for the loan that they uh -huh. are supposed to get to be able to complete this deal for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Both of you are absolutely right. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> you want them to qualify for this note eventually. And if you see on there that they just got foreclosed on last year, they had two repos of vehicles. And an eviction. Do you think they're going to qualify for this note anytime in the next 18 months? <laughs> you know, I mean, if you don't know, now you know. <laughs> so take a look. All right. Don't be afraid because remember, you're sandwiching this deal. You're not just trying to make a quick buck off somebody. You're trying to be a good professional real estate investor that makes wise decisions that work. If you don't and you put the wrong person in there, I promise you heartache, stress, anxiety, and misery. That put the right person. Very good. <laughs> no, you got to have the right person. Okay, rule number four. Pay the seller's mortgage for them. What do I mean when I say that? Somebody tell me. Whether the house has got it, whether you're receiving money or not, you got to keep up your end of the deal. Yeah. How do I know that? How do I know that seller is not pocketing all that money I send him every month, and not paying the mortgage with it? And this house is going to go into foreclosure, and then the bank is going to get it back. And then guess what? I'm liable for a lawsuit now on this option fee I took. So uh, I do. I do everything through an escrow company of service. Yeah. So you can do it with, through an escrow company service. Yep, that's correct. What is the uh, what is the fee for the escrow company to do that? I mean, they don't do it for free, do they? No. no. Nothing's for free. No. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I, I, don't, I don't really know because I don't use one. But what, what, do you, what do you do, Steve? How much is it? Is it 2 or 3%? Uh, sometimes it's a flat fee, like 10 bucks. If you're giving them enough business, all right, like the, one, the people that I have doing it are also collecting on mortgages for me and also this is just an added service. But if they're, if they're behind, I mean, they let me know, but they're not making phone calls or, or servicing it in that way. I'll, I'll do that. Pick up the phone and you know, shake their right to God in their face, but uh, that they collect it and it's, it's just a, they, it's 10 bucks, but you got to check around. A lot of law firms will do it. Some collection agencies will do it, but look for somebody that's bonded. You don't want them collecting your money and forgetting to pay either. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah. how exactly would you find something like that? Like if you were to look it up on Google or something, you know what I mean? Like if you were just to search it online, how, what would you look up? Just like certain mortgage servicers or I mean rent no, you don't want a mortgage service you probably want to you, you just want to just a, an escrow company or some sort just a normal escrow yeah. company yeah okay a payment escrow company or or you know like that rent escrow company a lot of uh, a lot of realtors uh, if they're mm -hmm. licensed by the state 
they'll do it. You know, some of them will do it. The management companies that handle rentals, they'll do it. So, yep, yep. There's there's uh, there's probably a handful of ways to do this. Um, you want to make sure whatever method you pick, though, that you are you are made aware that the mortgage is being paid. Okay, I have even had sellers object to this and say, well, I don't know that you're going to make my mortgage payment. And that's my credit we're talking about. Okay, great. So, Mr. Homeowner, if we can change up the agreement here where you make the payment to the home to the home mortgage company, but you show me proof of payment or you give me access maybe to log in so I can see the account or something. Um, have that asset. Would that make you feel more comfortable? Yeah. So, you know, you can set it up but it, several ways, but just make sure you're setting it up where you're, you're protected here. I forgot to bring up in, in rule number three, screen the heck out of your tenant buyer, that part of that is sending them to a, a residential mortgage loan originator. In other words, a, a home loan guy. I, I send them to 1-800-ROCKET-MORTGAGE or whatever. Okay, used to be Quicken. All right. But so anyway, but number four, pay the seller's mortgage for them. You, you want to make sure that's getting paid. That's, if they don't pay it, what's it called? Anybody know? If if your if your homeowner is not paying the mortgage with the rent, what what's that called? Anybody know? Fraud. It is fraud, but there's a term for it. It's rent skimming. Rent skimming. Yeah. At least that's what they call it around here. Okay. So in actuality, uh, all this all these that you're telling us to do, we should have some kind of cheat sheet to make sure and check off. Okay, I did this. I did this. I did this before yeah. you move forward with any of that. Yeah. I'm gonna give you that. That's a lot to remember. Uh, I'll get. <laughs> Where do you want to go? I, I I'll give you this cheat sheet when we're done with it. Oh, except oh, and then that other cheat sheet we were looking at too. I'll give you that too. So you should be good. Uh, uh, would that help you? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, my my memory's Jack, man. Okay, I understand, man. Me too. That's why I write it down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got to pay the seller's mortgage for them. Here's another thing you need to do too when you. When you do this deal with the seller, you need to make sure that the homeowner changes insurance policies. We talked a little bit about this last week. What, what are we talking about now? Somebody just recap before we move on to number five. Homeowner changes insurance policies. Why is this important? What are we talking about? Anybody know? Well, up until now, the homeowner has lived in the property. He has a I live there policy. It's a if rental I, insurance if I burn the house down, I live there, I burned it down, insurance pays for it. If you have a homeowner that moves out and a renter moves in, then he needs to change from a I live there policy to now I'm a landlord policy. Okay. Will that, uh, will that change? Will that, what's that word I'm looking for? Uh, because they have to, I guess they have to have insurance if they still don't have a mortgage, right? So, oh, yeah. so if they change it to a renter's thing, does that have any red flags for the bank or does that affect us? Uh, <laughs> very rarely will that affect you. Okay. Uh, only on certain loan types that the seller has. And if they're government backed, uh, like perhaps a VA loan or maybe some of these other government backed loans, they'll have a clause in the loan that says that you cannot rent this property out for the first seven years or until you've owned it for seven years or some number. And uh, so, yes, when the insurance company changes policies, they'll send a letter to the mortgage lender to let them know that policies have been changed for your records. Here's the new policy. It is now a landlord's policy. If that home loan lender has one of those clauses in his deal with this, you know, first home buyer, probably, and they're not supposed to be renting it out, they could technically call the note due, but they're not going to. I've tested it. I heard other uh, I heard other uh, investors actually add a renter's insurance for themselves, or or they tell their tenant to get renter's insurance. Yes, yes, yes. your yes. tenant also needs tenant insurance. Yep, yep. Tenant needs tenant insurance. I forgot to put that up here in number three too. I got all this written down myself, so I don't forget. Now look at me, dude. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, screen the heck out of your tenant buyer. You need to get them in touch with like Rocket Mortgage or somebody, and then they also have to have they're going to have have to have tenant insurance. Uh, pay seller's mortgage for them. Homeowner changes insurance policies. Okay, we, we are we all kind of clear on that. Number clear as mud, right, Philip? <laughs> you guys are like, holy shit! I thought these oh, were going to be nice, easy rules. These are fucking complicated. <laughs> it's not that great. No, we'll get it. You make you make it. You're making lease option much harder now. 
Nah, I'm making you a real professional at it. See, if I didn't tell you all this, you'd run out here and you'd make these little silly mistakes and they'd bite you in the butt. <laughs> these are the silly mistakes I've made and they bit me in the butt. And it's funny how when you make a little silly mistake, like making sure that you have the homeowner change the policy over to a landlord policy, when you forget a little thing like that, it's funny how the universe just suddenly picks that house for a kitchen fire or some shit. You know what I mean? Isn't that funny how your one weak spot where you fucked up, now it's just like, hey, that's the universe poking you right there. I've seen it happen, guys. So, you know, here's your checklist. We're putting it together. It's not that hard. Not that hard. Everybody's, <laughs> I feel like I discouraged everybody. Uh, I'm Max, so sorry. Max right. the match pays a visit. Say it again, Steve. I said Max the match pays a visit. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're not from New York, so you don't know who Max the Match is. It's okay. Is he like Max? Uh, Max with the matches have a successful fire. You see? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think I get it now a little bit. There you go. <laughs> Number five, no rent credits. What am I talking about here, guys? Anybody know? No rent credits. In other words, don't tell the tenant buyer, hey, your payment's going to be $1,000 a month, and for every month that you make it on time, I'm going to take $100 off the purchase price. Don't do it. The reason why you don't do it is because of the Dodd-Frank the Dodd -Frank Act, okay? Because they are looking for people who are trying to do unscrupulous things to tenant buyers, promising them things and setting them up for failure. Don't, And that's not the business you're in, okay? So... You keep it clean and you don't offer rent credits. That keeps it clean. You have a lease and you have an option. You don't mingle the two. To mingle the two would be rent credits. You're mingling the two with rent credits. Your lease and your option, now you're mingling the two. <laughs> okay, don't mingle the two. That Now, here's the next one. It ties right along in with number five. Oh, yeah. Use separate lease and option agreements. What am I talking about here? Anybody know? This is the last. This is the last rule. I'm not going to discourage you anymore tonight, Philip. <laughs> Mag is, is discouraging you. <laughs> uh, what do I mean? Use separate lease and option agreements. You got to use two different agreements, not one. Have you guys ever seen a combo agreement that's a lease option agreement? It's both, yep. both in one. Don't use it. Mm. Can anybody venture a guess why or tell me why? You want to separate agreements because on the back end, if you put a person inside this property, you want to be sure that the if you're going to evict them, it's just strictly on the lease. You know, you don't want to introduce options to the courthouse if you don't have, if you can get away with it. absolutely you drag a fucking option agreement up in there and they'll have it twisted four ways from friday into some kind of owner finance bullshit scheme you put together to take advantage of this and whatnot okay <laughs> don't do it and now it's a foreclosure then now you gotta foreclose these people yeah okay don't do it just and use both. separate documents right so the lease so sorry, yeah. the lease so the lease of both of those don't both of those contracts still go to the tenant buyer though right Oh, yeah. One at, a, one at a later date, one now, or how does that work? Oh, no, you can do them both at the same time. It's just I'm talking about instead of having the lease and the option agreement both on the same paper, you have two different sets of papers. One's the lease, and here's the option. That's it. Okay? All right. Now, there's more There's more to this one. <laughs> a quick question, too, on those on the contracts that you're making. Are, do you ever give a copy to the tenant buyer? You have to. Yeah. You have to? Oh, okay. Yeah. Number six, use separate lease and option agreements. Especially if you're doing this virtually. Especially. Especially if you need to evict someone in a different state. Holy shit, keep it simple and just have a <laughs> lease. You know what I mean? Okay. Now, number six, also when I say file your option. Use those separate agreements and then file your option. What do I mean by that? Anybody tell me? I should have said record your option. You want to record a notice of option, right? Yes. I'm not going to file the actual option agreement. Uh, let's just it's say show, <laughs> it's going to show dollar amounts and names and everybody else. I don't. I don't. I don't do that. I do. I do. I, do, I just record the notice of option, and it just saved me a lot of money. Ooh. So, so. 
So what you're doing, Steve, is you're clouding the title, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's what you want to do is you want to take your option now and cloud the title down at the courthouse. It should cost you about 60, 70 bucks if you're doing it the right way. <laughs> okay. I don't know. Different municipalities are different, but at least that's kind of been an average for me. But to, to file this down there at the courthouse, to cloud the title. Why do you want to cloud the title? <laughs> Anybody tell me. Why would I want to cloud this guy's title? And doesn't that seem mean? No, it's not mean. So that you have to be notified whenever someone tries to sell it or do any sort of financing on this property outside of your agreement. Yeah. If this guy tries to screw me and the tenant buyer, he ain't going to be able to without me knowing about it first. Right? That's why you do it. That's the same reason why you pay the seller's mortgage for him in rule number four. You want to relieve your risks here. And this relieves a lot of risk for you. And it gives the buyer's attorney a heart attack. Yeah, 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 because you'll have to release it at the end, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, that's the six uh, That's the six major rules there. I hope that was uh, not too too much and too confusing for you. I hope you enjoyed it, too, a little bit, learned a little bit. I know you guys said it was a little scary. It is daunting. When you're brand new in this business, that's why I recommend people do a few assignment lease options first, where you're just assigning it over, making some quick cash. But what you can see, it's more lucrative to do a sandwich lease option by far. So if you can, if you can kind of grow up in the business a little to the point where you can, you have a little money, you you won't spend all the money, or you can, you know, you can put the deal together using these rules. You'll stay safe. You'll have happy homeowners. You'll have happy tenant buyers. And when they move out because it didn't work or they had a change of life, then you have a much smoother transition and now another opportunity to make more money if you've done it right. If you haven't done it right, then you got people mad at you. So that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any questions, guys? I'm gonna I'm gonna take this video and I'm gonna burn it. <laughs> <laughs> this is like the most least popular session I've ever taught. People are like, oh, I think I'm gonna quit real estate tonight. Oh. <laughs> I'll I'll have questions once I start doing it. I'll, yeah. call, I'll call all you guys. That's cool. That's cool. I think I want to do this again. Yeah, let's let's do it. Uh, let's uh, let's help one another get deals. So, you know, if you've got questions or anything, you know where to find us, guys. I appreciate all you you being here. We've got several watching on the Facebook and several here in the room. John, Mag, Alex, David, Ginger. Good to see you, Ginger. Uh, Steve, thank you for being here, man. It's always a joy to see you. Victor, Philip, anybody, anybody, anything before we cut out of here? It's not a joy to see me. Say what? It's not a joy to see me. Only did, I not, did I not say that? Did I say no? No, my feelings are hurt. I'm going. I'm leaving. Bye, Victor. I meant. I meant double for you, man. Victor, I left you out because I had a special message for you later that I can't share for the group. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so well, what's this rated? Is it rated R or rated GP or what? Uh, look at Steve. Look at Steve. Uh, starting, starting stuff. Wow! Wow! <laughs> I do got I do got one question on um, when you're negotiating price with a with a with a with a seller of the house. Um, as far as the price of the house, is it going to be lower as far as the price that you're giving the the seller for a sandwich lease, or is it the same if you're like going to assign it or sandwich lease? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's about the same either way. You know, you're going to calculate your sales price to the tenant buyer based on the 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 amount of appreciation in that neighborhood for the term that you can get. Okay, that's kind of how you calculate it. So it's it's all done the same, no matter whether you're going to stay as a sandwich or an assignment. You, and, and the ballpark figure is if you're going to do three years, you know, you, you can probably tack on 10%. That's kind of the general rule of of things. So, yeah, either sandwich or, or assignment, doesn't matter. Anybody else? Sorry, Steve. What'd you say? That'll work. Let's talk about sandwich lease options. Let's do a few case studies. Y'all into case studies? Let's make some case studies happen. I'm going to share the screen with you. And we're going to jump into some case studies here. First one here I want to show you is not this one. I'm going to try to move my uh, move my cameras around and stuff where I, can, where I can see the page and click through. All right, here we go. Look at this one. Isn't this a pretty house? This is your typical pretty house, okay? Um, well, this is a three bedroom, two bath, two car garage. 
what do I normally call that? Anybody in here know? Let me let me add some uh, some notes to this one here. This is a bread and butter sandwich deal. Bread and butter. <laughs> you guys have heard me talk about bread and butter. That's what I'm talking about. A three bedroom, two bath, two car garage. Yeah, Ryan said it. Bread and butter. Bread and butter. Bread and butter. Mm. Man, it fits nice with the whole sandwich you know, concept. <laughs> bread and butter. All right. So we got a bread and butter deal. A three bedroom, two bath, two car garage. Let's talk about the numbers. Let's put some numbers in here on the seller side because this is the deal I was able to negotiate with the homeowner. Okay. This property is worth $215,000. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Fair market value up here. Let's put that up here at the top. It's worth $225,000. $225, and the fair market rent for that neighborhood is $1,750 per month. Okay. Now, these are the two major indicators that I have to be aware of in order to evaluate this deal. What is the fair market value of the home? How do you find that out? FMV, fair market value. PropStream, sometimes Zillow, other places, comparable sales is the correct answer. But fair market value, 225000 Fair market rent, what does the neighborhood rent for? Well, this particular neighborhood rents for about $1,750 a month. Okay, I was able to get the property under contract with the homeowner for two fifteen. dollars all right, that's only ten thousand off the two twenty five fair market value. Okay, but that that adds up. Okay, so we, we have a fair market value two twenty five. The agreement with the seller is for two hundred fifteen thousand. Now, what about rent monthly with the seller is fifteen hundred a month. Okay. Now remember, fair market rent for the neighborhood is seventeen fifty. So we got a nice little spread. There. What was his mortgage? Um, his mortgage, I don't really know that to be honest with you. I don't really know, but I'm I'm going to guess somewhere around one eighty six ish. Uh, Okay, he okay. had he had money on the bones. Yeah, definitely. So you gotta find those houses uh, in order to be able to make uh, the payment for the mortgage, and then have, have have needs to have a spread for him and for you, right? No, not necessarily for him. No, it just happened to work out this way. You know, um, I, I I negotiated two fifteen because the fair market value is two twenty five. He was open to two fifteen. That works for me. I don't care that he that he owes one eighty six. Um, is he going to make money when my tenant buyer buys? Sure he is. And that's okay with me. I'm also going to make money. So, I'm talking about like the yeah. monthly payments though. Th yeah. His monthly payment. I don't know what his monthly payment was probably somewhere around 1250, 1300. So he's going to make a couple hundred bucks a month. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes we feel like we have to know all this detailed information about the homeowner's policies and, uh, and, uh, not, not policies, but the mortgages and payments. And, um, it, it's not absolutely necessary that I understand completely as long as I know that it's, that it's less than what I'm paying. Obviously, I if he has a, a $2,500 a month payment for some reason, that's going to blow this deal up. It's just not going to work, you know. So the fair market rent and his payment, have, you know, or what I'm paying him have to be comparable here. Or there has to be a spread in my favor, one of the two. Down payment. This seller here is wanting $2,500 down. Okay. All right. So what I did was I, I put this property under contract for two fifteen. dollars Rent, I agreed to it for $1,500 a month for 36 months, and I put $2,500 cash in his pocket when we changed keys. Okay, so I went out and I marked the price up. I marked it up to $247,500. Okay, $247,500. How did I figure that? Somebody explain to me how I came up with that number. Anybody have an idea? Nobody has an idea. <laughs> okay, if you take the purchase price, I mean the fair market value, 225. Take the fair market value, 225, and you add 10% to that for three years, 36 months. That's 10% on top of 225. Okay, you're going to add $22,500 to that. Okay, so you're going to come up with something close to 245,000. Okay, so I put 247,500. All right. <clears throat> doesn't have to be an exact science here. I'm just in the right neighborhood. It's a bread and butter deal. Pretty house, three bedroom, two bath, two car garage. Monthly rent for this guy, the tenant buyer. Um, I did $17.50 a month because that's the fair market rent for that neighborhood. I gave the tenant buyer, instead of 36 months, I gave him 24 months. Somebody explain to me why I did that. Anybody know why? I only gave the tenant buyer 24 months instead of 36. All right, guys. One of the rules last week, one of the rules was is to always give yourself more time than you give yes. the tenant buyer. Better best 
uh, well, you're giving yourself a grace time here, okay? You're giving yourself grace period. So if the tenant buyer comes up to the 24 months and he still needs a few months to qualify, you can do that. If you have it built in a, a little cushion here, this is one of the rules. Leave yourself more time than you give the tenant buyer. So I've got 36 months. The tenant buyer has 24 months. If he comes up to 24 months, he needs a few extra months. Hey, no problem. I've got 12 months to play around here. <laughs> okay. If my tenant buyer moves out in the first year, then I've got two years left. I can still replace him and do this deal all over again. Okay. Down payment. The seller wanted 2,500. The option fee I collected out of this tenant buyer. Oops. I'm having a hard time typing tonight. $12,000. So that means option profits to me were 9,500 because I subtracted the 12,000. I, I took 2,500 off the 12,000 because I had to give it to the homeowner. So that left me $9,500 cash in my pocket, right? Oh, I forgot to do the month, monthly spread up here, $250, okay, $250 a month. Now, how do I calculate my back end profits on this deal? Anybody know? Anybody want to tell me? We're going to take 247500 Okay. We're going to subtract what we're going to subtract here what the uh, what the, the option fee is, which you put in 12000 Okay. So we have uh, 247500 I'm going to get my calculator out here just so I can make sure I'm thinking right. 247500 minus 12000 Okay, which you already put in as option fee, right? That gets calculated against the purchase price. Now I'm going to subtract the purchase price over here on the seller side when he buys, when the tenant buyer buys, that's 215000 Okay, that leaves 20500 Okay, now I'm going to add the down payment that I paid because that, that, that got deducted off the purchase price over here on this side, on the seller side. So 215,000 minus 2,500, okay? So I'm gonna add that back in. So my total profits on this deal, on the back end, okay, would be $23,000. How much monthly rent am I making? How much monthly rent am I making? What's 250 times 24? 6,000 bucks, guys. So 23,000 plus 6,000, okay? equals $29,000, $29,000. That's a bread and butter deal, bread and butter deal. Let me move this video, man. All the videos get in the way of the screen and I can't, uh, I can't work with the screen hardly. That's a bread and butter deal, guys. Anybody, anybody wanna tell me how much I would've made if I just did an assignment wholesale on this one? An assignment wholesale, wholesale lease option, assignment. Okay, remember I took 12,000. I had to give 2,500 of that to the, to the owner, that leaves me $9,500. I would have made $9,500. But because I'm sandwiching it, I'm going to make twenty nine grand. Big difference. Big difference, guys. Big difference. This one here, we're going to call it, that was bread and butter. This one here, we're going to call it something different. We're going to call this one here, the sweat equity house, aka can't sell on market. Now, this one here is interesting because this one here, the property needs work. It needs work. So I'm going to have to add repairs here. Okay, so we're gonna add repairs because this house is not perfect. What do you do when you call a lead like this one I called? I'll sh I should show you a picture, shouldn't I? I'll show you a picture after I get done doing this because if I do it, it'll erase my numbers. This house here was that red one, that first one I showed you. I'll show you here and again in a minute. But what happens when you call a lead? In this particular case, okay, the fair market value is, uh, let me see, let me look here at my notes, 115,000, okay? And the fair market rent is 950. Okay, but this house does not really qualify normally as a lease option. Do you remember in order to qualify as a lease option, this has to be a pretty house. It has to be a livable house. You gotta be able to live in it. The tenant buyer has to be able to live in it. That's what I'm saying. They have to be able to go to the bank eventually and have an inspector come out and appraiser come out and appraise the house and the lender wants to loan money on it. And if it needs work, then it's not either, it's either not, either not gonna inspect outright or it's not gonna appraise outright, okay? Most of the time, I would tell you this disqualifies it from being a lease option, okay? But not necessarily, okay? So let's take a look at one that I did that was, uh, that's what I call a sweat equity deal, 
Okay. This one here, I structured just a little bit differently than that last one, which was a traditional one, bread and butter. In this particular case, the house needs, needs some work. So fair market value, I guess we could really technically say, we could say ARV because it needs repaired. All right. Fair market value or after repair value in this case is 115000 Okay. The purchase price I was able to negotiate with the homeowner is 95000 So you can see there's $20,000 worth of possible equity here. But what stands in between the 95 and the 115 is about 10 to 15,000 in repairs. That's right. This house needed, it, it smelled bad. Okay. It had cat piss in the carpet. It had the old wood looking paneling, which is horrible. Okay. Ugly. Like I'm talking the 1960s shit. Okay. It had that everywhere. The old wood color doors, the cosmetics in this house were atrocious. All right. <laughs> not updated whatsoever. Not kept up to the times. Not kept up at all. All right. What I can say in, in benefit to this house was the big five, for the most part, were pretty good. Okay. Yeah, the HVAC's a little older, but it works. Okay. The roof is in good shape. The foundation is in good shape. The plumbing is old school, but it works. Okay. The electricity is old school. Not, not fuses, but it's a, it's a breaker box. Okay. It's older school, but it but it works. Okay, so that that's okay. It hasn't been all updated to the two hundred and what is it two twenty amps or whatever. <laughs> you know the new big box. Uh, they haven't upgraded to that yet. So, but but the electricity, all the five major systems of the house work pretty good. This house though is ugly when it comes to cosmetics. <clears throat> this is not going to appraise out at one hundred and fifteen because it's it's needs repairs. It's it's really bad. Okay. Uh, cosmetically. All right. So rent though, I was able to negotiate with the homeowner rent. We're looking at, uh, we're looking at nine fifty a month. Now, I know that doesn't sound good. It's the fair market rent for the neighborhood is nine fifty, but at least it's nine fifty. I'm not over. Okay. Fair market rent for the neighborhood is nine fifty. I've got, a, I've got a deal on this property for nine fifty a month. I, I can live with that. All right. Um, let me show you how that plays out with the sandwich here. The term on this one, I got 36 months again. And the down payment, this homeowner wanted no down payment. Okay. Does that happen? Oh, yeah, that happens. That happens pretty frequently. Okay. In this particular case, the homeowner knew. He knew that the house needed work and that it was in bad shape. Okay. And he was just happy to get this off his plate. Okay. Happy to get it off his plate because... He doesn't live there anymore. And the house is in bad shape. It smells bad. Everything's bad. He knows it. Okay. And he's probably still going to make some money in this somehow. Okay. That's okay. I don't mind him making money. I'm going to make money too. Okay. That's why you hear me tell sellers all the time. Hey, here's what I want to do. I want to put some good people in there. I want to make a little money doing it, but I also want this to be a reasonable solution for you. Does that make sense? And can we go ahead and talk or is this over? Okay. So this is what I'm referring to. I don't mind if a homeowner is making a little money. That's their house. They can make money. I don't have to take all the money or it's no deal. Okay. So he wanted no down payment though on this particular deal. Now, so I took it. I thought, well, it's not a spread enough to be an ugly house deal. It's not a pretty house where people can move in right away. So what do I do with this deal? Do I throw it away or do I hang on to it for a minute and see if I can do something more creative here? I, I, I thought about it for a little bit, and then I decided to go ahead and do this deal. And I pitched a lease option. The guy said yes, so I put it under contract with those numbers, 95000 I know it needs ten k in repairs, fifty nine fifty a month, 36 months, no down payment. Okay, great. So I found a tenant buyer that can go in, and I set them up for the purchase price of $115K. That's fair market value. The rent, I put them in there at nine fifty a month. Okay. The term, I put him in there for 24 months. And the option fee he had, okay, wasn't very much. $3,500, that's it. Why did I do such a low option fee? Does anybody have an idea? Property needed work. Yeah. If I take all this, if, if I take this, all, all this guy's money, what the hell is he going to fix it up with, right? So I have to be reasonable here. If I jack the rent up from nine fifty, which is fair market rent, and, and I jack it up to 1200 I might not have a tenant buyer at all. 
Or if I do, now he's paying more for rent than everybody else in the neighborhood. And maybe that's eating into his paint money or his new carpet money. You know, maybe that's eating into the vanity and the mirror and the new bathtub that he needs. You know, he needs an insert real bad. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about? He needs a bathtub insert real bad. Okay. So, yeah, I want to be reasonable here for all parties. And this is an ugly deal. This It's not really a, a pretty bread and butter deal. This is a sweat equity deal. So I'm going to let this guy, the, the, I'm going to let the tenant buyer keep a little money. I'm going to let him make a little money too. Okay. So 115,000 fair market value. I got it for 95. So there's 20 there. I set him up at 115, the tenant buyer. So I got a potential of, of $20,000 back end here, except he already paid 13 or he already paid 3,500. So I really have a potential back end of $16,500. My monthly spread is zero. I don't really recommend doing a lot of those, but this one here, I just felt like I wanted to do it. <laughs> okay. Grace time. I gave, I have 36 months. I gave the tenant buyer 24 months. So I have 12 months grace time. All right. Option profits. Remember, I don't have to give the option fee, any of it to the tenant, to the uh, seller. I collect it from the tenant buyer. But I, in this particular example, the seller did not want any down payment. He didn't require it. So I got to keep all $3,500 right up front. I make nothing monthly. And then while the tenant buyer is in there, he adds the repairs of 10K or he does a lot of the, the work. Okay, 10K, maybe if I hired people to do this, but he can probably do it, elbow grease, a little sweat equity, okay? And increase the value of his home, right? He's helping the seller out too, because if he backs out, the seller gets to keep all of the improvements, <laughs> okay? Um, and he gets to do this opportunity that he would not have had normally. Now, this is a win-win-win for me. It, it, to my estimation, this is a win-win-win. The homeowner wins because he gets to get out of this property at 95K, which is a number that he chose. He's happy with that. He gets to collect 950 a month, which I'm sure his payment is probably only about five something. All right, so he's making money monthly. He did not get a down payment though, but he is getting repairs made to that property at no cost to his own of his own. So it's a win for the homeowner. It's a win for the tenant buyer because he gets into a property that he can own, okay? He can do the repairs himself. He's a handyman and there's lots of them out there. Cosmetic stuff is easy to do nowadays. A lot of it, click lock flooring, stuff like this, okay? They've made it where, you know, you can go to Home Depot and fix your home, okay? <laughs> so there's there's a lot of stuff that you can learn to do real easily that if he doesn't know how to do it, he, he's got buddies and he's got YouTube and he's, he's very excited about fixing up the place. This is also good for him because he's going to get to pick the paint colors and shit. Okay, him and his little woman, they want to have kids. They want to have, you know, all this family stuff happening. It's nice when mama can pick the paint colors. Well, when he's doing the repairs, he can pick the paint colors. So that's a good thing. They were very happy about that. Very excited about that. Okay, they get to pay $9.50 a month in rent. That's just normal rent. Okay, I don't make anything monthly. I got $3,500 bu in my pocket when he starts. Okay, and then I end up getting... $16,500 when he buys. Now, I could have been nicer. How could I have really made this a sweeter deal for the home uh, for the uh, tenant buyer? Let's say I did not find a tenant buyer so easily and I needed to sweeten the pot a little bit for the tenant buyer. Anybody else have any ideas on how I could have sweetened the pot a little bit for the tenant buyer? Okay, fair market value is 115. I have it under contract at 95, okay? Here's how I could have done it. I could have made it sweeter for him and sold it to the tenant buyer slightly cheaper. I chose not to. I didn't feel like I needed to on this one. The guy was there. He made the offer. I took it. We boom, done. Okay. Had I needed to sweeten the pot, I could have lowered it, the purchase price for the tenant buyer from 115 to 105. Okay. I could have taken less profits on the back end for myself, left a little bit of that equity there for him. And that would have truly been a sweat equity deal. Okay. Does that make sense what I'm saying, guys? See, there's not a lot of moving parts to these calculations. To analyze on these deals, there's not a lot of moving parts. There's the purchase price, there's the rent, there's the term, and there's the down. That's about it. And then if you have to write them out in a format like this on a sheet of paper, turn it sideways, landscape style, write a little chart out like this and fill in the blanks and start analyzing your deal and say, hey, this is how much I would make on the front end. This is how much I would make in monthly. 
this is how much I would make on the back end when, when the tenant buyer buys and I have this much grace period. Okay. This is a deal. I think I'll sandwich. Okay. This is a deal. I think I'll sandwich and I'll stick in it because this is the money. This is the prize at the end. Okay. Um, we could do one more if you guys want to. I think I have one more I pulled out. Let me show you the picture of that one first. I said I would show you a picture. Um, I got to move these uh, videos around so I can share this picture. Let's share a picture of that one there. This is the bread and butter deal we were talking about before. <clears throat> this here's the deal I was just talking about. Nine fifty a month. <clears throat> I'm not making anything monthly, but I did make thirty five hundred dollars on the front end. And I do stand to make 16500 if the guy performs all the way through the contract and buys the property. What do I have invested here to lose? Somebody tell me that. What do I have invested in this deal that I could lose? Nothing, really. <laughs> Not a damn thing. A little, a little bit of my time. But I got paid for that. I made 3500 bucks. Oh, yeah, I was about to say you got paid for that. Now, if, if, if I did a good job putting this tenant buyer in there, which I think I did, I've got a $16,500 paycheck coming. Actually, <clears throat> yeah, 16500 yeah. So this, I made 20,000 on this house or I will when it's all wrapped up. So not, not bad. So even on a crappy deal, like this is a small little house. I mean, this looks like a house that could be sitting anywhere. This could be in Kansas city. It could be in Kentucky. Okay. It could be shit, you know, anywhere. And it's ugly. I mean, it's got a little brick face to it, but it's got this wood siding stuff. Remember I was telling you on the inside, it was like this fucking, <laughs> it's just ugly, man. Like, like nothing's like nobody ever, put any drip on this <laughs> or swag or whatever, you know, uh, that's just the way it goes. And you'll find deals like that. You can still monetize them though and make money. Um, let's take a look at another, oh, not that one there. Let's take a look at another one. This one here, we can go over this one too. If you want, we got a few minutes left. This one here, this is a cutie. This one here though is different because this is not bread and butter either. Can y'all tell me why it's not bread and butter? It's not a three bedroom, two bath, two car oh. garage. How do you know it's not a two car garage? Looking at it. <laughs> yeah, it's got one garage door. Okay, so it's not completely bread and butter, but it's not even really close. This is a two bedroom, two bath, one car garage. Two bedroom, two bath, one car garage. Can you do two bedroom, two baths? Well, why couldn't you? Sure, it's not bread and butter, but sure, there are people out there that want to own two bedrooms. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, let's go back here to our form. And let's do a little work on this one. Fair market value is 125,000. Okay, fair market rent for this neighborhood, 1,200 a month. Kind of a higher rent neighborhood, which is okay. That's great for me. It's gonna work out really good in the long run. Purchase price I negotiated with the homeowner was 125K. This guy would not budge. He wanted full asking price. That's okay, because that's what I offered him. I offered him full asking price, full market value, 125K. The rent. He wanted nine fifty a month. Okay, nine fifty a month. The term again thirty six months. It could have been twenty four or sixty or whatever. I just I play around with thirty six a lot. Down payment that this homeowner wanted was twenty four hundred dollars. So I, I put it out on the market for a tenant buyer. I come up with a new purchase price by adding ten percent to one hundred and twenty five thousand. And I end up with this, 137500 okay? The monthly rent that I can charge is 1250 Now, remember, fair market rent for the neighborhood is $1,200. we are still in the neighborhood, okay? $1,200, that's what fair market rent for the neighborhood is. I owe the seller $950, but I put it out there for rent at $1,250. I'm going to get $50 more a month than everybody else in the neighborhood. And you can do that. That's not a big spread. That's not a big, you know, a big difference between the normal twelve hundred and for the neighborhood and into twelve fifty that I'm collecting from this guy. All right. The term. This guy I've talked to his lender, and he said he needs um, about just just under three years. So I went ahead and uh, signed him up for thirty two months. Okay. He felt comfortable with that. His lender guy felt comfortable with that. That still gives me a grace period of four months. Okay, that's okay. If he needs a couple extra months, I got him. Not a problem. Down payment, the option fee, I, I owe down payment $2,400 to the seller. The option fee I'm collecting from this tenant buyer, $8,500. $8,500. Monthly spread, I forgot to put that up there. Monthly spread would be $300 a month. 
back in profits. Well, let's do this option profits first. What's what's eighty five hundred minus twenty four hundred? Because I owe that to the seller. Sixty one hundred, guys. You guys got to have a calculator. If you don't have a calculator, get one on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> got to have one. Got to have one. You'll make mistakes like me if you don't do it. If you don't get your calculator. Sixty one hundred option profits. Okay. Now, how do I calculate the back end profits? Okay. Well, remember I'm putting twenty four hundred down, so. I've got to do the 2400 and take that off of the 125,000 purchase price. Uh 125,000. No, 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 no. Yep. Yep. Yep, you're right. Uh 122,600 is the purchase price after I put the 24 down. <clears throat> okay, so the new purchase price is 137,500. He put down 8500. 6129. So that's 129,000. Okay. Let's do that. Let's put that down there like that so you guys can see the math okay so that brings us to a total of 129,000 what we have here on back end profits is I'm going to take the 137.5 I'm going to subtract the 8,500 that he put in and then I'm going to subtract the 122,600 okay that leaves me yeah so what's my total profits down here guys somebody somebody with a calculator Tell me what they are. You got to do the monthly rent spread. What's what's that? What's 300 times 32? Let's do that. 300 times 32, 9,600. Okay. So what's 6,400 plus 9,600 plus 6,100? 22, one. 22, one. Somebody's chatting with me and I can't see because I'm I've got so much happening on the screen here. So I hope I'm not missing something. <clears throat> 22,100 dollars. Twenty-two thousand one hundred dollars. What do you guys think about that? Woo. I put sixty-one hundred dollars in my pocket today. I'm going to collect just under ten grand from the guy over the next two and a half years, and then when he buys, I'm going to get another sixty-four hundred dollars check. Is that deal worth doing? If I was going to do an assignment deal here, if I was just going to assign my position over to the tenant buyer and execute a wholesale lease option, how much money would I make? Sixty-one hundred dollars, <laughs> right? He put in 8,500. I have to give down payment 2,400 to the homeowner. If I'm assigning this deal over to the tenant buyer, I'm going to make $6,100. That's your assignment profits. But because I'm doing a sandwich, I'm making the monthly spread and I'm making a back end profit. And so that, that brings us to 22,100, which is a difference of $16,000. Is it worth sandwiching that deal to make another 16 grand? I think so. I think so. Absolutely. Let me see if I can show that to you again. I'm going to show you that house. That's the ugly one. There you go. $22,000 on that house. $22,000. $6,100 in my pocket up front, $300 a month for two and a half years, and then another $6,400 on the back end. Let's take a look at this, though. How, how much was it? I, I've already erased it, though, I think. How much was it to do uh, – how much – Let's see on that one there. I'm looking here at my notes. Um, fair market value was 125, and the purchase price we did was 125. No equity, but yet I still was able to put together a deal to net $22,100. You guys seeing the beauty in this? How can you take a property with no equity on a pretty house like this and still end up making 22,000? That sweat equity deal, though, that's probably one of my favorites because, see, that dude's caught in a lurch. He's caught in a lurch because he can't sell his house on the market because it needs these repairs, right? Doesn't want to rent it out because it needs these repairs. So where does this guy have to turn except for a guy like me, which on a sweat equity deal, sweat equity deal like like what we were talking about um, tonight? Um, he, he, could, he could do the same deal you did himself, but he just don't know how. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so instead, I'm going to swoop in. I'm going to be the hero and I'm going to make 20 grand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. It, 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 see, isn't it fun? I mean, once you learn to practice this guys, and, and I know some of you are quiet tonight because it's Wednesday night and you guys are usually a little bit quiet on Wednesdays, but also because when you're looking at these numbers, it's like your brain just, you know, you're like, ah, okay. You got to practice a little. 
Give yourself a little bit of time. Be patient with yourself. Get yourself a little Casio calculator or put the calculator app on your phone. Okay. And practice with a few scenarios. Watch this video over. Watch the first video on sandwich lease options where we went through it. We went through another case study type scenario. That was an example. These are case studies, but basically same thing. So, you know, um, if you're not, if you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm kind of confused. How is this all working? And how does this, you know, these numbers and am I doing it right? Okay. It's going to take a little practice. Okay. Because everybody's not so whippy with the numbers and how they work. Okay. So watch the video, ask questions in the VIP club, you know, ask us what we think, uh, how we would do it. I'll, I'll answer your questions. Uh, other people in the club will answer your questions too. This is a way Sandwich lease options, why I want you to understand them is, is really for one reason only. Look at my hair now. Uh, the numbers. Okay. Because the difference between a, an assignment lease option, like on this deal here, the assignment, I would have made $6,100 that last one we were talking about. But instead of $6,100, now I'm going to make $22,100. Just imagine what that's going to do to your life, your lifestyle. Give yourself a raise. <laughs> give yourself a raise be smart about it stay in the middle and make a lot more money capturing that back-end equity and that monthly that monthly spread it really adds up guys it adds up a lot on that other deal the sweat equity deal i'm not making any monthly spread but i made thirty five hundred dollars in my pocket and then when he buys i'm gonna make 16 grand it's almost like it's not even fair how's that fair how do you make fifteen thousand dollars out of thin air how do you make twenty thousand out of thin air Guys, the numbers don't lie. Those are numbers. That's math. That's that's probably the most real reality that we have <laughs> is the numbers. And they are what they are. So practice with the numbers a little bit. Is anybody in here willing to admit they're kind of scared of the numbers and they get confused when they're staring at the numbers? Is it or is it just me? No, that's me too. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's probably probably a few others that wouldn't admit it, Ed. But Ed, you're a true a, a true uh friend and, and, and a man and you're you, you don't have those uh hang-ups and you're just like hey yeah that's me <laughs> yeah, that's, you, okay. that's me sandwich lease options guys that's case studies next week we're going to wrap up our sandwich lease options here uh for a while and we're going to talk about paperwork and how to put the paperwork together we're going to go through the paperwork i'm going to have paperwork to give you okay aisha says she can help anyone with the numbers if they want see People in the club here are helpful. They want to help each other, want to help you. And there's some people that are just wired differently up here. Some of us were taught differently too. You know, that's just life. So, you know, it's okay. But I'm telling you, once it clicks though, this lease option numbers and how you how you analyze a deal like this, once it clicks, you'll be able to do it just like that fast in your head. Like it's pretty easy. There's not much to it. Get your Casio out and pop a boom. Oh yeah, okay, excellent. Oh man, I'd make 25 grand on that. I think I, think I might... I think I might go ahead and sandwich this one. Okay. All right. Don't forget the rules last week when you're doing these sandwiches. But next week, we're going to talk about paperwork, how to fill it out. Because it's important. It's important that you know how to fill out the paperwork. If you can't fill out the paperwork, you can't do the deal. Justin, I got one question. Yeah. How'd you find that um, for the, the ugly house? How'd you find that tenant buyer that was going to willing to do the work for the sweat equity? Was it just Facebook yeah. Marketplace? Yes. Yes. Oh. I put an ad together. That's just like a normal ad that I would do for a normal lease option deal, except I said in there, sweat equity, okay? Home needs cosmetic repairs, okay? Make it what you want it to be. Dude, you'll be surprised how many people will hit you up on an ad like that. Okay. okay? Because they can't go down to the bank and buy a house today, but he's a super handy guy and she believes in his handy abilities and they're going to tackle this project together and make this a family home. Dude, there's shitloads of people out there like that. And I'll tell you another thing. I've had I've had it houses like this. I should have done this case study. I've had houses that they were on fire. <laughs> they were they had caught on fire with the previous owner, or maybe after the owner had moved out and it was abandoned, like it was empty. The house had had, had some minor fire damage to it. When I say minor, minor fire damage can be still pretty bad. Uh, so I, I've even had them do that, and I've thought, man, there's no way in hell anybody's going to want this deal. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna try to squeeze all the equity out of it. I'm gonna. Let's say on that example we were talking about with the sweat equity deal, the ARV was 115, and I sold it to the tenant buyer for 115. I could have. I could have gave him some of the equity and been nice and, and went in at 105, uh, sold it to him at 105, but mm -hmm. I didn't. Okay, so I lowered the price on this one that was the fire, 
Uh, and I thought, man, nobody's going to even rep- respond to this one at all. I was, I was surprised. Uh, there's a lot of people out there willing to go in there and completely gut a kitchen. Oh yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Completely gut a bathroom, completely gut, you know, take all the carpet out and redo the floors. You'll, you're, you'll be amazed, man. And he told you that the repairs were about 10 K or that's what uh, he told you yeah. what it needed. You guessed. No, the homeowner said that. Okay. And then, and then when I sent the tenant and I had pictures too. And then when I sent the tenant buyer in the tenant buyer confirmed that, yeah, it's, it needs this and that and all that. But Hey, but here's what he said. He's like, yeah, it needs carpet. It needs paint. It needs new kitchen, man. Hell it needs everything. He said, but honestly, <clears throat> we like it, man. We want to do it. So how do we do it? <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's, it's, uh, it's not as difficult as it sounds. I've also discovered, and I, I'm going to say this, um, without trying to stereotype anybody, but, but, but it's true in a sense I've had a lot of Mexican families, okay, or Hispanic families that have come from other states or, or they have family here, or maybe they've, maybe they're new to the area, you know, um, and they have, they have great interest in getting into properties like this. Mm-hmm. And so they're handy too. They know how to do it. They know how to fix the concrete patio out back where it's cracked and, you know, lay new tile. And, and some of the work they do in some of these is impressive. Some of it's not, some of it is. So there's a lot of opportunity out there. And uh, I have found down payment to not really be a problem for the Mexican or Hispanic buyers, tenant buyers. Okay. Not a problem. They have cash. They have cash. I I don't know what a lot of people's perception of, of Hispanics and, and, and Mexicans are. Um, I know if you watch TV, you think they just cross the border and they're just over here, you know, doing whatever they do. And a lot of them are just real poor and they don't have any money and all that's bullshit. It's all bullshit, okay? Because it's not like that at all, really. I mean, maybe maybe for some, but the, a lot of them are skilled, okay? And they have talents and abilities and tools even. And a lot of them have cash. And and a lot of them don't mind working on projects together as a family. So it's, it's a perfect fit. It's a great fit. And they're interested in living in this neighborhood. So it's a great fit. Okay, thanks. I know that was a long-winded answer, man. But, <laughs> but I, I've... Uh, Steve... Driscoll, he's in our club here. He brought to the VIP room one night a little device he bought. He bought a little device about like this size off Amazon <clears throat> and it translates for you. <clears throat> I want to get one of those because it's hard sometimes to communicate with those prospective tenant buyers because I don't speak of the, the language. <laughs> so guys, um, the beauty of America is, is you can open your mind to a lot of opportunities and there are lots and lots of different kinds of people out there with money and, and they're good people ready to do something. I want to share screens with you here and talk about paperwork tonight because paperwork is important. You know, I think it's amazing that I have students that follow my content like all the time every day and they are working. If you ask them, they're working on doing their first lease option deal or their sandwich first sandwich lease option deal or maybe their first coho sale deal, but they've never actually read the paperwork ever. <laughs> they've never read the paperwork. It's, we're not going to read the paperwork tonight, but I'm going to show you how the paperwork works, where to find it. I'm going to put I'm going to put it in the VIP group uh, tonight, so you can find it there uh, after the we wrap up here, as well as the subject two stuff for Vernon. But I, I will put the sandwich lease option paperwork in the VIP club tonight, and this is basically what it is. Okay, uh, what you're going to fill out with the seller, in red here. Uh, lease option, the lease with the option to buy agreement. Okay. Um, let, let's talk about something real quick. I, I want to share screens again in a different way. And before we jump into the, showing you what these are, actually showing you the documents, um, I want to let's see here. Yeah, here we go. I want to show you this. You guys remember this chart? I used it for the case studies. I'm going to put this chart in the folder that I share with you tonight so that you can use it to analyze some of your lease option deals. Okay. Like we did in the case studies to figure out how much profits you'd be making versus let's say back end money. I mean, versus just like assignment money. Okay. Um, now I'm going to include that, but then I'm also going to include, let's see here, this right here, rules for making great sandwiches. You guys remember us going through the rules. I had them written down. This is a little bit more reader friendly, okay, uh, than, than what we were doing, working with in the session a couple sessions ago. Okay, so 
but 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 I want to remember. I want you. I want you to remember something here. Okay. Um, it says right here in number six of the sandwiches rules here to use separate lease option agreements. All right. Separate lease and option agreements. All right. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show you this folder again. And in the folder, actually, you know, I keep deleting off of it, clicking off of it, but it's right here. You can see there is number six. The rules was is use two separate agreements, a lease agreement and an option agreement, two separate ones. Now, you guys know out there in the world, there are agreements that are a combo. There's a lease with an option. It's a combo agreement. So it's all in one agreement. Rule number six of making great sandwiches is use separate lease and option agreements. Okay. Now, what I'm referring to is, is with your tenant buyer. Okay. With your tenant buyer. Use separate agreements with your tenant buyer. Up here, I have a lease with the option to buy two in one document. Now, that's what you're going to use with the seller. Okay. Let's take a look at it. And let's take a look at the rest of the documents in there as well. All right. All right. So I'm going to click the seller side button here. And it's going to pop up lease with option right here. One, one document lease with option. All right. So I'm going to click on it. You can see what it looks like. It's a fill in the blank kind of thing. Okay. Residential lease and option to purchase agreements. Okay. The date you are the tenant buyer. This is between you and the seller and or signs landlord seller. Okay. That's their information. The homeowners rent blank per month lease. How many months commencing when, what day and ending on what day. Maintenance, purchase price, option period. Okay, so this has everything you need. Now remember, there's another rule. Okay, let's let's talk about this rule. There's another rule, and it is right here. Let me back up. Let's take a look at the rules again. It says right here, number five, no rent credits. No rent credits. Okay, but what I'm referring to there is is mostly for your tenant buyer. <laughs> okay. Don't use rent credits for your tenant buyer because you'll see in this particular agreement, um, there is a place for rent credits. Okay. Number seven down here on this agreement, rent credit. Tenant buyer shall be credited blank per month towards purchase price. This might be a good idea for you when you're using it with your sellers, but don't give your tenant buyers any rent credits. Okay. If you can talk your homeowner into a 50 or $100 rent credit every month, you know how much money that adds up to be in 36 months? Another few thousand bucks. Okay, that's why this is worth it. All right, so I want to be clear about the rules and, and the paperwork. Okay, because it looks like they contradict in those two ways, but but really what I'm referring to with the rent credits is with the tenant buyer. What I'm referring to with the two two separate agreements, the lease and the option agreements, is with the tenant buyer. Okay, because with the homeowner, I still like to use a lease with option agreement, all in one, and I like to get rent credits too if I can. Okay, <laughs> okay, so I I hope I'm. I'm pretty clear about that without confusing everybody. Does that make sense so far? <laughs> Everybody's like, uh, what? That's between you and the tenant, right? Those agreements. No, that's between me and the homeowner. Okay. Oh, okay. So yeah, let me, let me show you here. The, the whiteboard. Where is that a, at? That's in the lease option 2.0. I, no, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give it to you tonight. I'm gonna put the link in the VIP group okay. on Facebook and mag you're not on Facebook. So I'll have to email you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. What about um? What about if um, the lease uh, the one that you just showed me the lease option agreement memo. Okay, that's for assignments. That's for assignment lease options. That's in the lease options 2.0 course. Okay, so that's for assignment lease options. This is for sandwiches here. Okay. So a whole different set of paperwork. Uh, what I was just showing you there is the lease with option to buy agreement. Okay, that you will use when you're contracting the deal with the homeowner in a sandwich lease option. Okay. Okay. So that, that's the lease with option to buy. Also in that folder is an optional borrower's authorization. Okay. What do I mean by that? I'll show it to you right now. And let's go there. Authorization to release information. If you ever find yourself in a situation where, like Vernon is saying, the homeowner wants him to contact the mortgage company, kind of get permission to get information and kind of step in and, and manage the account, you know, then this is a document that Vernon will want to use. Authorization to release information, okay? So it was, it was a great example of this tonight when you brought this up. This is something that, that you'll wanna have in your kit just in case you need it, okay? This is kind of an optional thing. You won't need it every deal, 
but it is in there. Okay, so there is the op there is the optional borrower's authorization. Okay, now so that's the lease with the option and the borrower's optional. That's the optional borrower's authorization. Now, once you have that lease with option filled out, here is a memorandum of option. What do I mean by memorandum of option? Okay, do you remember rule number six in sandwich rules is to use separate agreements, but file your notice of option at the courthouse. How do you file a notice of option at the courthouse? This document right here. Okay. So when you get the homeowner to sign your sandwich lease with option, you want to go ahead, maybe have them sign the bank authorization, you know, the, the authorization to talk to the bank, but you, you also will want them to sign this memorandum of option. Now this option agreement leaves out all this, this memorandum of option leaves out all of the private information and numbers that are on the actual option agreement that you just filled out. Okay. All right. It's, it's actually um, a more standard. It's just a, a notification that there's an option agreement somewhere out there. Okay. Look at number one, the above parties have entered into an option agreement dated this, that that's coming right off your option agreement there. Your, your lease with option. Okay. Number two, this option agreement shall expire on blank. Okay. That's right off of that lease with option. Number three, all terms and conditions of set agreement are incorporated by this reference as set, if, this, if set forth in full. Okay. In other words, what it's saying is, is number three is without saying everything that that option agreement says, this, this represents that. And this, this is what I'm going to file at the courthouse. Okay. So this is how you file your notice at the courthouse without having all of your private information and the seller and everybody all out on public blast. Okay. This is just a notification. Okay, so you'll need both of these and you'll want to file this one at the courthouse. Okay. All right. Now, on the offset chance that you get into an agreement with a homeowner and you need to back out. Okay. Here is an amendment to cancel. Okay. You just fill this out, send it over to the homeowner. Maybe he doesn't want to do the deal anymore. Or maybe you don't want to do the deal anymore. For whatever reason, it's not working out. Tenant buyer hasn't moved in yet, all that. You're just like, hey, I got to walk. Okay, then send the amendment, which is a release and cancellation of contract. Okay, send the amendment to cancel. All right, that's if you need one. All right, probably won't need that very often, hopefully, if you're doing things the right way, but you will probably need it at some point in your career. So we have the lease with option. We have the optional borrower's authorization. We have the memorandum of option agreement, which you file at the courthouse. And then we have an optional amendment to cancel if you need it, if you need to back out. Okay. That pretty much wraps up the seller side. All right. Am I boring you guys to tears? <laughs> Paperwork is kind of boring, but you'll get there. All right. Embrace the chaos of understanding these papers because it's really the objective is to get everyone to fill these out in a way that makes them all comfortable. All right, let's talk about the tenant buyer paperwork. All of what we've talked about so far, you can lump into at the very beginning of the deal. When you're calling the lead, you're getting the homeowner under contract. All that's right up front. Okay. Now with the tenant buyer, we're going to be talking about collecting monthly money and we're going to be talking about getting that back in money, the equity in the deal. Okay. So let's take a look at that folder. And again, like I said, I'm going to share this folder with you so you guys can have this material, look at it yourself and make any adjustments you want. Keep the good stuff you like, throw away the stuff you don't want, but let's take a look at the tenant buyer side. Tenant buyer side in it, there is a residential lease agreement. Okay. This is a lease agreement. Now you'll notice there's a separate lease here and then there's a separate option to purchase here. Two separate agreements. It's for abiding by rule number six in rules for making great sandwiches. All right. Residential lease agreement right here. If you don't have a lease agreement in your kit, this is a pretty decent one to throw in your kit. Okay. All right. You'll want to go through here and make sure that you adjust things to fit the situation. Okay. Like for example, cancellation. If for any reason tenants choose to cancel this agreement prior to can prior to taking possession, there will be no refund of any monies received. If you don't like that, you want to give them back some money, then change this. Okay, all right. Um, you can change anything you want in this. This is a lease agreement. It's easily changed. I recommend 
Um, not changing number 12 here, subletting an assignment, tenants may not sublet the premises. Keep that the way it, it, the way it's written, okay? You don't want your tenant buyer then, then going ahead and trying to do a lease option deal with your lease option deal, all right? So familiarize yourself with some of these things. If there's anything in here that needs to be changed, maintenance and repairs may need to change. Tenant has inspected the premises and acknowledged that, is, that is, it, it is in satisfactory condition and accepts said premises in as is condition as suited for the use intended, okay? Tenant agrees to accept responsibility for all maintenance and repairs of premises, as well as all damages that they or their guests may cause. You might want to change this to $250 per month per incident or per incident per month. Okay. You'll want to edit this. Okay. So there's not going to be one that's going to fit every situation and every, every deal. You're going to have to get comfortable with changing up some of these, some of these clauses and things. Okay. All right. Now um, let's slide down here and see if anything else pops out at me. Okay. Um, no, it's just a pretty standard agreement. Pets, if you want pets, if you want to allow pets, you got to change that. Okay. That's a good case in point. Okay. Just, you know, just know that you can. Okay. This is just a lease agreement. Okay. Um, now we have a, that's a separate lease agreement. Now we're talking about for the tenant buyers here. Now we have a separate option agreement. Two agreements. One is a lease. One is an option. Remember, this is rule number six and making great sandwiches. The reason why we do this is because if you need to evict your tenant buyer for some reason along the way, it will be much easier to evict them if you're just bringing a lease agreement to court and not a combination document that is a lease with an option, okay? It'll be much easier, much cleaner if you keep these documents separate. So that's why you saw me just go through a lease agreement. Now, now we close that one out, we open up this one. This one is an option. So now I'm offering the tenant buyer a lease and an option. Okay. And the option agreement, it's just very, very, very simple. All option agreements are. Okay. This is not a purchase and sale agreement. This is an option to buy or agreement. Okay. So you don't, don't get the too confused. You will need, your tenant buyer will need a purchase and sale agreement when they go to buy at the end. But at the beginning, when you're putting them in place, you're going to need a lease agreement, which we just went through, and then this or an option agreement. Okay. So here we have an option agreement, option to purchase. Okay, during the time period, option period of blank through blank. Okay, number two, price, full purchase price. Okay, that will be your marked up price. Not the price that you got it at the seller, with the seller, that was a different document. This will be for the tenant buyer, so this will be your marked up price. Exercise of option. To exercise the option, buyer should give written notice to the seller as soon as possible during the term of this option agreement. How does he do that? You tell your tenant buyer when you want to buy, when you're ready to buy, just bring me a purchase and sale agreement for the price listed on number two and you got a deal. That's it. That's how it works. Okay. Now the rest of this, you can, you can see it's pretty standard boilerplate stuff. Okay. Right of assignment. Number 10, you'll probably want to change this because you don't want your tenant buyer having the unqualified right to sublet or assign. Okay. I would recommend changing this. Nope. That's it. Okay. Now, there's a couple other documents here I want to, to share with you um, just so you can have them in your toolkit. This is a promissory note. Does anybody remember why we were talking about sometimes needing a promissory note? Anybody want to volunteer that? Let's talk about promissory notes. Why in would case I need the a tenant buyer doesn't have all the money up front. But yeah, in case, to you. yeah, in case he doesn't have all of the option fee up front, he has half. And I agree to let him make payments to me for the other half. Okay, then I'm going to set him up on an installment agreement or I, I will use a promissory note, which this is what it is right here. Okay. All right. So just uh, just so you have a, a promissory note. Okay. And you can sign it down here at the bottom. Okay. That's where the tenant buyer would sign it, by the way. All right. Now, another document here that you're going to need is an assignment agreement agreement. You will use this only because this is a sandwich. Only at the end of the term when the tenant buyer goes to buy. Does anybody understand or, or want to share with us their understanding of why you use an assignment agreement at the end when your tenant buyer is going to execute their option to purchase? They're going to purchase this house. They got a loan teed up and they're going to buy this property. Why do you need an assignment agreement? How do you close a sandwich lease option deal? This is just a basic assignment agreement, by the way, guys. Nothing flashy here. Just you're looking at the whole thing. Anybody have ideas on how we can close up a sandwich lease option? Get that back in money. How do we do it? We got a contract. We got a contract with the homeowner 
and now we got a contract with a tenant buyer at a higher price. How do we get that money? How do we close them? You sign the contract that you had with your uh, with your seller, and you're gonna have them sign that piece of paper, and you're gonna sign your contract to them. They're buying that contract that you had with your seller. Is that correct? Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna enter into a purchase and sale agreement with the homeowner. Then I'm gonna assign that 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 over to the tenant buyer for the amount of the equity that, that, that they would be paying me in the deal. Yep. What is my other option? Is there any other way to close a sandwich lease option besides using an assignment? Okay, you will go to Google sometimes if you're looking this up and you'll type in sandwich lease options, how to close the sandwich lease options and you'll go down the rabbit hole reading some articles and they'll tell you that you must double close. Do you know what I mean when I say double close? I mean double escrow close. Okay, they'll tell you you have to double escrow close. That means you buy it with money from the homeowner and then you turn right around and sell it for more to the tenant buyer and they buy it with money. Double escrow close. Now, would you have to get a, a transactional funding for that? You yes. You, you would have to get transactional funding or you'd have to have deep pockets. Right. So when, when, I, when, I, when I'm buying ugly houses, I, I write up the contract. I write it so I can assign it. I got the loophole so I can back out of it. But I don't put my name on the deed. I mean, on the, uh, on the contract. I make up a land trust. I put the land trust as the buyer. And when I sell it to my uh, investor, I just get him to buy me out of the, uh, out of the land trust. And nobody knows yeah. nothing. That's what, that's what I do. Yeah, that's a good technique, especially on ugly houses. Yeah. Um, yeah. On, on these pretty houses, though, uh, you're going to have more conventional lenders. Mm -hmm. that the tenant buyers are working with and uh, it probably wouldn't work for them to buy an LLC or a land trust or something like that. Maybe I'm not, I'm not sure to be honest with you. I'd have to look into that, but that, that's a good, that's a good question, Vernon. You, yeah. Yeah. With the, with regular lenders, that's going to be a little shaky, but when you yeah, got people yeah. throwing cash around, this is, is no problem. Yeah. So on these pretty house deals, these sandwich, uh, sandwich deals where you're, you're doing a, a lease option and you're staying in the middle all the way to the end, the articles that you read on Google will tell you that you have to double close, but it's not true. Okay, you don't need to double escrow close these. All you need to do is when the tenant buyer is ready to buy, have your have your seller and you enter into a purchase and sale agreement, and then you use that assignment agreement that I was just sharing with you, and you assign the deal over to your tenant buyer. They can take it right to the to the escrow company or the closing attorney, and they know how to put the deal together, and you then become part of the bill. Right. Okay. Be on the HUD one. You get on the HUD. Yeah. So you, so that's how you do it without going through needing a transactional funder not needing all the the bull of all that okay so uh, you might so run the, into some cases go ahead. go ahead i'm sorry no that's fine Philip. what you got um so the seller's preview on what you're doing right because you're letting him know i'm going to sign this contract to yeah. the tenant so he knows yeah 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 from the very beginning from the very beginning really yeah uh so uh, shouldn't be a problem there um, if you want to keep it from the seller, then you could do a double close. You could do a double close, a double escrow closing, mm -hmm. keep it from the seller. Um, if you're making a enormous spread, that's what I was wondering about. Okay. This may be something you want to consider deeply. Um, my experience has been depending on who your lender is for the tenant buyer, the tenant buyer's lender, depending on who their tenant, the tenant buyer's lender is, there will either be uh, mortgage companies that don't want an assignment at all involved. Okay. Um, there will be some like that. In that case, you may have to double close. Okay. There will be others that the, the, the mortgage guy is okay with it. Everybody's okay with an assignment in being in, in the situation here. Um, but they don't like that you're making more than 10 grand. Mm -hmm. Okay. I find that 10 grand is about the limit. I have had, and listen to me, please don't learn this the hard way. I have had um, mortgage guys. I have had um, hard money lenders even throw deals out, okay, because I was making too much money. All right. Um, they look at the deal. All the numbers work. They're excited to loan the money, and then they find out, oh, my gosh, <laughs> this guy, who is who is Motu? I'm Mr. Motu, baby. How can I help you? Well, this contract says – you're going to be making $35,000 on the sale. I'm not loaning money on that. We're not doing that. Okay. I've had that. I've had that happen. Okay. I might, I might let you have 15. 
Okay. I found out really the number is about 10. Okay. <laughs> if it's, if it's 10 or less, assign the deal. If it's more than 10, then think about it. Do a little research with your tenant buyer, find out who they're getting their mortgage through. What kind of loan is it conventional or is it some kind of a government back deal? And then consider maybe I should be doing a double closing. Okay. Most of these you're going to be able to do an assignment though. Okay. But if you're going to be a professional lease options guy, then you're going to need to eventually kind of figure out how to do a double close in, in, in the chances, in the cases that you're making a whole lot of money. <laughs> Does that make sense, guys? Yeah, I've been wondering about that uh, because it, I suppose everybody's in the room, right? The seller and the buyer, tenant buyer? Um, no, rarely will they be. No, they will not be in the same room whatsoever. Um, they will just be... Uh -oh showing up to the title company probably at separate times. And, and we're talking about the, uh, well, yeah, you just do one close. So you're, we're talking about the end of the deal. Yep. We're talking about the very back end here. Yep. The back end of the deal. When you're, when the tenant buyer is going to, to go buy, you're going to have a, a, you're going to need a, a purchase and sale agreement with you and the homeowner. And then this assignment agreement right here, number three, that you fill out with your tenant buyer. And then they can take the purchase and sale agreement and the assignment agreement and go to the title company or the closing attorney, just like you would with an ugly house. Does that make sense, Greg? Not completely, but I don't want to, I don't want to hold everybody up. I'm going to have to figure that out. <laughs> okay. Let's break it down real quick. Let's break it down for Greg. There's no shame in that. No dumb questions here, man. Let's break it down. Okay. So you have a lease with an option, right? Right. With the seller. All right. Got it. Now you also have over here with the tenant buyer, you have a lease and then you have an option. Right. Okay. Two separate documents. All right. So the lease, we all understand how leases work. Let's say if it was 24 months or 36 months or what have you, the lease is what it is. It's monthly. So that, okay. That kind of works itself out in time. <laughs> now the option with the seller, let's say the option with the seller that you had was to buy the house at $100,000 sometime in the next 36 months. Okay. Now, you have a lease with the tenant buyer and an option for them to buy it from you at $115,000 sometime in the same term, 24, 36 months. Okay. Got it. So there's 15000 in profits. All right. Now, you're in the middle here, though. So, sandwich Greg in the middle. Mm -hmm. So, how do you get this 15000 That's the difference between what, the, what you owe the seller and what the tenant buyer owes you. Well, you, you enter into a purchase and sale agreement. Okay. With the seller. <laughs> right. For 100K. 100K. Okay. Right. Now, now you've got a tenant buyer that's ready to buy though. So you, you go to him with your, with your new purchase and sale agreement for 100K and you say, Hey, Mr. Tenant Buyer, I want you to sign this assignment agreement. Okay. Where I'm assigning this purchase and sale agreement over to you. Okay, you can see the purchase price for that is 100, 100 grand, but the fee that you're, that you're going to pay me, okay, is 15K. And that's exactly when the buyer's finding out about it. No. About the 15K. No. Well, I mean, the buyer doesn't necessarily know how much profit you're making in the deal right. until, until now. Yeah. Until now. That's what yeah. I meant. Yeah. I've never had one care, though, Greg. Okay. Okay, because they agreed to this two or three years ago. You know, I, me making a profit is is a foregone conclusion for them. They, they they believe I'm making money somehow. They they might not understand how, but this this is how. And well, of course, typically you've also gotten a uh, you got money up front, right? Oh yeah, you got yeah. your upfront money too. Yeah, but this is how you close up the deal here. Okay. So you avoid having to do a double closing because you've got this assignment agreement here. And assignments don't cost anything to close. You don't have to have a transactional funder or anything. So I was late coming in, uh, but as far as the, the uh, 115K, uh, was that already discussed yeah. with the lease? Uh, yeah. 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 So basically you said three years, and if you want to buy, it'll be 115 at, at the end of three years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's it. So let's run through the scenario real quickly here. We've got paperwork here. We're going to fill out the lease with the option to buy agreement with the seller for 100K. Okay. Uh, we're just going to use the same example here for 100K. Let's say it was 100K. Okay. We have, we have borrower's authorization form. We could use memorandum of option. We're going to file it at the courthouse saying that we have the right to buy this house for 110K. Right. That's basically what it's going to accomplish for us. 
It's going to cloud the title, keep him from selling it to anybody except us and our tenant buyer. Okay. We have an optional amendment to cancel if we wanted to back out, but we're not backing out on this. We're moving straight ahead. Lease agreement with the tenant buyer, just a straight lease agreement. Now, a straight option to purchase agreement at 115 k All this is happening right up front when the, when the tenant buyer is getting ready to move in, where we're qualifying him up and he's getting ready. All these agreements happen right here. Straight option to purchase for 115 okay? Now, when he goes to buy, when he's ready to qualify at the bank, that's when I get the assignment agreement out, right? I get a, I get a purchase and sale agreement with the seller and I assign it over to the tenant buyer for a $15,000 payout of equity, right? Does this make sense now, guys? Your, your numbers are a little off. You got oh, 110K. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. I'm dumb. Hold on. Why am I doing that? Let's do it right. I, so I was saying 100 though, right? Yeah. Well, first time. <laughs> Second okay. time, 115 or one, okay. 110. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So you got an agreement with the homeowner for 100K and then yeah. you're going to mark it up on your option agreement to 115K for the, for the tenant buyer. And then when he goes to buy, you're going to get a, a purchase and sale agreement with the seller for a hundred, right? <laughs> and then you're going to assign that to the tenant buyer for 15 K that's going to be paid out to you at closing. So you get your, you get your pay of the 15 only at the end. Of that equity. Yes. That's the back end. Okay. But you remember in a sandwich lease option, you're still going to collect a non-refundable option fee up front cash. Okay. That's yeah. That's what I was wondering. Okay. Yeah. You're also going to collect a monthly spread yeah, yeah. between right. the, he's going to pay more rent than you're paying. So you're going to keep a little monthly. Yeah. And right. then you, you get to the back end by using a purchase and sale agreement with the seller and an assignment agreement with the tenant buyer. That's how you do it. Or you could double close if you want to, if you want to do it to a complicated way. Could you put a lien on it and have the seller directly sell it to the buyer and your lien is the profit? And not necessarily one way is, is right or wrong. It's just ways of doing it. But that's how I do it is I will do an assignment, okay? Some folks double close. Some people will go maybe put a lien on the property and let it clear off at closing when when, when closing attorney or, or title company sends them a check. Yeah, because a lien can be any amount, right? And it's probably yeah. be very questionable. So. And it could be for whatever, you know. Uh, now, if you just a side note. If you file a notice of option at the courthouse and your tenant buyer goes to buy, uh, they're going to do the first thing they're going to do at the title company or their closing attorney is they're going to run title check and they're going to sh sh nike in their pants. Okay. Because they're going to see that someone here has clouded the title for X amount of thousands of dollars, or we can't see what the number is, but there's a cloud on the title. Uh Oh, we got to clear this up before it can be bought or sold. That's you. Mm -hmm. So when you get the phone call that says, we got a problem, there's something clouding the title. We don't know what's going on. We're going to have to figure it out. Hey, Hey, it's you. Remember, you filed a notice of option, a memorandum. So that's you. That you tell them that? You tell them that? If you remember to. Or you can, get, <laughs> or you can give them all a good fright. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, boy. But you'll have to release that before, you can, before they'll be able to clear it up and, and make the deal work. And that's exactly what you wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. It protected you in the deal. It kept anyone from doing it without you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's why you do that. So there's assignment lease options. That's what you've been looking at. And then there's sandwich lease options. So there's two different strategies here. Kind of get get these get the the portfolios of paperwork on your computer in places where you know where which is which. Kind of organize your business up here. Like, okay, I want to do a sandwich lease option. That's this. Okay, no, I think I want to do just assign this one over. Okay, so these are the paperwork that I'm going to use for this. Okay. That's what that's what I do, guys. It's real simple. Sounds sounds silly just saying it like that, but you know simplicity. Ah, oh, it's the beauty of life.